This is the Gomaluku podcast. No, this, this is what, what I wanted to say is, is that um, for a while, like these deep dives conversations, um, I just want to figure out, like, I wanted to do this live um, because I wanted to, like, um, um, yeah, have that conversation where everyone, if everyone can be the wallflower in, into that conversation. Um, but then again, I what I realized was I was so focused on the people that are watching that I kept it focused on like, all right, it, did this number goes up or go down? And I was not focusing anymore on the the conversation itself. Right. You know, so and and I'm a guy that can easily lose focus. You know, it, it's it, it's what I what I what I, realize, what I realized. Not just during these podcast interviews of conversations, but like in in general in in the past as well, is yeah I lose focus easily. So when I see a number go up or down, I'm like focus on that for a second, and then boom, I'm I lo- I'm I'm lost in the whole conversation. Right. And I'm like, and then all of a sudden, like like, like for example, you you explain something, and and I just f- forget the follow up question, or like like just trying to do not understand what, what you're saying. So um, I don't know. This is just me, way, my way of saying, like, I, I stopped for a while at least doing these these long-form conversations live, just record it and then post it on, on YouTube and podcast. But you, you do regularly updates live. And that is something that I really admire. Um, the the um how, how should i say it um just i don't give a fuck you know yeah. like I just go live and just talk and how where did that originate they the you know what i'll just gonna do it because that is something that not a lot of that i would love to do myself 100 percent, and it, I, i'm sure that a lot of other indigenous people want to do it as well um just picking your brains a, a little bit um so that they can stand on your shoulders in a way, like be inspired by it. Right. Um, can can you, is there an example or experience that you can point towards like, yeah, that was the moment that I was like, yeah, I'm just going to have to go live. Um, I, I think, yeah, you know, in the beginning, I kind of was like how you explain, I, I overthink it. I, mm-hmm. I, I was focusing on how much people was watching it and I was focusing on, you know, all these different things. And, and, you know, I tried to be like prepared for like a structured conversation because, you know, before we, we used to do these lives, we, you know, me and my uncle used to have this show that we did for public access TV called Sovereignty Conversations. Yeah. And we would always, um, you know, have like a certain way that we would do the show. Uh, you know, there would be a topic and there would be these extra topics and then we just go boom, 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 boom down the line. And, you know, I I just began seeing how other people were utilizing their platforms and their social media. And, and, you know, because, you know, if you have like all this following and like, you you know, you can't really put so much information into a post because people will not pay attention to it. You know, Mm. there's not like something, these conversations can be written out and people will spend like 15 minutes reading your post and it's like you know pages long yeah i'm more intrigued by the people that go live and just share what they feel you know i mean i love to i love it's it, it goes back to that voyeurism you know that people have inside mm. them they, you know especially like you know I man i like to listen to like some of my cousins because you know we have a the way of talking in hawaii it's pidgin english right it's mm-hmm. like, it's, yeah. it's of like hawaiian and immigrant from the plantation days but i love to watch them go live it doesn't matter what they're doing they can just be eating at a restaurant but i'll watch because i like to hear the conversation happening you know you feel like you're there with them and you're having a good time too and so you know i always used to think you know because especially because of like the pandemic Mm. we don't have this interaction where people coming up to our village visiting and then we, we get to interact with people and have these like you know show people around we don't do that anymore so this is my way of doing that you know what mm. i used before and give these presentations to people but they're more private and intimate you know people always forget to record them but once in a while they used to record them and yeah. so 
now instead of having that conversation in person with people, I just go live and, you know, just something that's on my mind for that day or, you know, something I seen bothered me or, or something I seen inspired me. I'll just go on and, and just start talking about it because one, it, it, it makes people aware of um, situations that they weren't maybe paying attention to. And number two, it, it enga engages our community. It engages mm. them to, you know, even like me, I, I, I'm just getting used to reading the comments and answering questions before I just used to ignore them. And I just used to <laughs> yeah. mm. and talk about what I wanted to talk about because, you know, in the very beginning, you, I used to get all kinds of trolls on there. And like, you know, you're not the nation. You the, you know, we got the kingdom over here, blah, blah, blah. And all that. And me, I used to start getting, you know, take them personal and, you know, almost mm. like, go at these guys and then that would totally ruin what i was gonna do so i used to just ignore them but now i engage more i talk with people if there's a like a stupid comment i just blow past that and i, I yeah. comments and i just it's just mainly a way to humanize social media you know even though they, they're taking my data you know what i mean this is all being stolen this is all being whatever <laughs> yeah. it, it doesn't matter they, you know I, i've been seen enough to where they pretty sure they got one file on all of us so i don't care anymore yeah yeah, yeah. once you break through that paranoia of oh people are gonna follow you people are gonna know what you're thinking people are gonna know all these things i don't even care anymore you know it's my mm. if if people i think the more they can relate to you the more they, they'll there's a buy-in and and now we can like talk like we you know we know each other like you know i i i, un I understand you know what you're going through people can relate to mm -hmm. generation people right there you know we're not quite you know the younger like tiktokers and all that but we're not like my uncle bumpy them's age we're like right in the middle and that's mm -hmm. what us is like we need some sort of um somebody to help guide or somebody to help like bring their issues forward right mm -hmm. because we're the generation where you know, we get student loans, we get, you know, we have a hard time um, go buy our own house. We, we have kids. How do we provide for that? How does this affect me and my kids? How does being in the movement affect, mm -hmm. you know, my life? We, we really have to think about these things. The older generation, they had a little bit more freedom because, you know, it was, it was a little bit more freer. But today, you know, the, there's consequences to everybody's action. You know, they can't, be sovereign as, as, like we used to you know they can't be you know just drop everything and, and go protest somewhere for like three months yeah you, you're probably not gonna have one house one car and one mm -hmm. family. yeah so it's just trying to give that insight and that voice to people that that are watching from the outside and not necessarily want to go all in but they want to check it out they want to see how do it's you know mm -hmm. how it relates to them yeah I, th I think like your lives that you're doing and for people that are watching and listening, I highly recommend you to um, follow um, Brandon on, on, on Facebook because you're, you're primarily on Facebook, going live on Facebook, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, you got Clubhouse now too. I saw, I saw you're on Clubhouse. Yeah. Oh, I, at least like we're friends on Clubhouse. Yeah. I have, just, have it, yeah. Huh? Have you, have you tried it already? I, I'm, I'm just listening. I'm, I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, actually, I, I we did our first, um, one of my friends that invited me to Clubhouse, she invited mm. me to speak in this room because um, the, sh her name is Peggy Leo, but she has like, um, sh she's works out of Shanghai and she works in like the Chinese technological sector. And, and she's okay. like the go between between the US and China on some of these things. So really intriguing lady. Mm -hmm. But she's also like really like new age spiritual and all that. So she actually stayed at this um, healing retreat on the big island with one of my friends. And she was explaining this project that she was doing um, to my friend and talking about how, you know, these um, Navajos on, on in this village, she was helping them to um, get water, get electricity, mm -hmm. kind of almost be like a, an innovation hub, something similar to our pool. Home. Yeah. And so she was like, Oh, you need to meet my friend Brandon, you know, because they're doing the same thing. So she invited me on Clubhouse and then she put set up this room where we talked about 
um, native intelligence or indigenous intelligence mm. and how to apply to modern times. So I was the guest on that show with her. And uh, I talked about, of course, the Ahupua system. Yeah. With the land division for Hawaiians where, you know, we had our whole society built on. Mm -hmm. So I talked about how we're doing that and bringing that to a modern day and utilizing the internet, utilizing technology, utilizing networking with each other. We were building the Ahupua in today's time. Yeah. And we had a show uh, last week, Tuesday. It was scheduled to go, you know, about an hour and a half, two hours. Yeah. I left the show because this is an ongoing conversation. They can just keep going. Yeah, 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 definitely. The seven and a half hour mark. Wow. This stayed on to nine and a half hours. Mm. On the conversation that started at three. It started at three for me in Hawaii. These guys started, you know, they, they're calling in from the East Coast, from the West Coast, from China, from all over the place. I don't know what time they got off, but I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy, this clubhouse, you know, because it's it's just conversations. And, and me, I'm scared because, you know, I talk plenty already. I don't like get caught up in these conversations because then it'll distract me from like other things I'm doing. I just, I'm just leery of that. But, you know. If the room is about you and all that, you don't mind, you know, going mm -hmm. off, you know, but it's it's amazing because it's like it's a place where I think people feel comfortable because there's no pictures, there's no mm. tech, there's no video. They're just adding their voice to a conversation. And and so you know, people that believe in like manifesting, people that believe in that kind of stuff, they're going to these places and then they're talking about their dreams, talking about all these things. And they're trying to like manifest these things on using technology, having these huge conversations with people from all over the world, from India, China, you know, it's, it's going to, I mean, I think it's going to grow up into a big thing, but you know, you got to be into that kind of platform. It's, it's like a, I would say it's like a live chat room, you know, yeah. You know, like in days, the old chat rooms you used to go into, somebody just put up a <laughs> You know, guys is like cruising the chat rooms and all that. This is the same thing. Mm, yeah. You know, it's like really happening, like chats. Oh, definitely. It, it is for, for me, um, the way that I feel, uh, sense it, it, it eliminates friction. Yeah. And then you, you can just bump into a conversation and like it, it, it's, it's it's already ongoing. Yeah. So yeah. You, you, you jump into the conversation and listening, like, oh, okay, this is what they're talking about. And, as soon as you're, because while you're listening, you can also browse browse to other conversations, and there's hundreds of conversations ongoing already. Um, and I've been I've been just the way that I use that when I look into like new platforms is I I monitor it, I just watch it, or in this case, listen to it for at least ten days or ten hours. You know, like I just I just want to want to understand first before I contribute. Um, so I'm I'm still in that in that like in, in that. Um, yeah, no, I hear you. The learning, learning, listening phase. Uh, but yeah, it is, yeah, like it is, it is a fun way of, of another way of contrib contributing um, to, um, in, in this whole pandemic, right? Everyone is all locked up in their own, in their own little, little bubble. And, and this, this limits friction because, yeah, there's no picture and just, just voice. And yeah, it's just you, you, your, your iPhone and and you're just talking to people and there's so many rooms and I'm I'm already like there's uh, exploring rooms and they're like there's about man yeah like manifestation law of attraction and there's even one room that's like tin full of hats you know like it's so yeah. well hey, they, got, they got like you know Bill Gates comes in there and talk yeah they got like uh, Elon Musk was on there so you know you can just jump in these conversations and Elon Musk is talking about you know jet propulsion and then you switch over and bill gates is talking about you know real estate and vaccines vaccines and, you know, yeah yeah weird you know it's a weird space but you know if you're going in there looking for knowledge or looking for you know some sort of like networking you know that kind of stuff i gotta send you this article bro you know that that, that project that my friend is working on with the the navajos you know yeah. It's it was on it was in Forbes magazine or something, okay. but it's so you know we started to talk story with them, but they you know it's a it's a it's an article about how they're utilizing Clubhouse to organize and get people same kind of like us, bro. It's it's almost the same story. They're bringing in 
invest, they're bringing in people, they're bringing in people that want to invest in building up their community, you know, and, and, you know, people always leery of, you know, other companies or somebody coming in, right, and then buying out because, you know, now they're going to control your tribe or they're going to control your nation. But mm-hmm. on these people's terms, you know, there's no strings attached. The, the deal is you just come and help. Yeah. And that's what the VR, you know, that's what you get paid in is the goodwill, the good nature. But also, like, if your technology, you know, does well, you know, this is like a pilot, test pilot for you. You never need pay the state or the, or the you know, the city to test out this thing on a population. You have the population to test out this project right here. And that's what you make. You know, you get data from it. You get to see and you get to be part of a great story. Yeah. And that idea is exactly what we're doing in our nation we're doing the same thing it's just that somebody else is doing it too you know and it's it's badass you know i yeah. i wish more people would start doing that and i think they will you know we're we're, we're ju- it's just getting started this whole idea that sovereignty has to come through politics and sovereignty has to come through you know agreements and treaties and all of that is 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 a fallacy today you know mm. it, with, with the internet and you we're going through political barriers we're going over these barriers you know if we can develop your own economy you can develop your own um independent uh, healthcare system if you can develop your own independent education system guess what you're independent mm. you're not dependent yeah. on anybody you know you, mm. you you're done it already and yeah, if they want to recognize you, okay, that's the cherry on top, but they really didn't need that. You need to be able to cut the chains from, you know, from the oppression and, and go off and, and do it on your own. And it's not easy, but that's why you have platforms like Clubhouse. You have all these other ways where we can connect with these people, with, with these technologies, with this innovation that want to do good. Mm-hmm. Don't where to to put this or, you know, don't see like the right project, but they'll see like somebody like the Navajo or somebody like the nation of Hawaii. And they'll say, Oh, you know what? Let's test it out here. You know, I want to see how my, my combustible um, toilet does in Hawaii where it doesn't, you know, drain into the ocean. It, it turns into ash and then they use that ash and they fertilize their cow farm and all that kind of stuff. You know, you, you can't pay for that kind of publicity. Mm-hmm in real life and we'll broadcast that for you and it'll yeah. be a living thing mm. you know? look <clears throat> yeah let, let's dive deep into that because that, that that's um one of the many reasons actually why i love to talk to you or listen to you and what i wanted to prick your brain about and i think is, is that a good starting off point about nation of hawaii that we, we could yeah. start with that and then pivot obviously um um and many different things is um uh, I had I was fortunate enough to um to go to to Pu'onua, uh, Waimanalo, the nation of Hawaii, 2016, and I did not know what to expect. Um, uh, I, I was told uh, because you know, we had the International Indian Treaty Council, uh, which my um, traditional council is is a is a affiliate member of, and um, yeah, went flew all the way to, to Hawaii, first time in Hawaii ever. Um, it was always on my bucket list. Um, and then not only do you go to Hawaii, but you go to a place that is, um, it is an, it, like an utopia in the making to a lot of indigenous peoples. So l- l- let me explain that. Um, so that people understand, um, well, not, not explain it in full because I'll, I'll let you do it, Brandon. Um, uh, it is, uh, what. I, will, I would think of as like Indigenous Sovereignty 2.0, as in um, what you can do with, um, like you said, Brandon, like claiming sovereignty. You you don't ask for sovereignty. You claim it. And and what you can do uh, when you have a piece of land and like community and everything else. So we, were, we went into this bubble, all these Indigenous people from Latin America, Central America, North America, Pacific as well into this bubble um, and which was an amazing experience as in getting to know like the, 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 the foundation, the principles, they're not getting to know, but like you're you're living it, you're living in in, inside of, of what Indian sovereignty could be. And the the most beautiful thing of it is 
it's not finished yet. You know, it, it is it is in the beginning. It, it, it's a building block, and you can see it it, it, it developing. Um, so just just my my, my brief observations, like when, when I was there for when I was there for for a couple of days, and then then you see the contrast. You see the contrast when you go out into Waikiki in Honolulu, uh, Kaneohe. Like it, it's totally different. You know, it is um, what, what some would could some would expl uh, explain as plastic, plastic Hawaii, and I I'm, I just feel that I've, I've I'm, I feel privileged to have experienced the Hawaiian sovereignty in in the way that it can be in 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 a way that you guys are bu building in 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 Waimanalo, and the contrast with how what it has become, uh, what Hawaii has become, and which is what I would like to um, other Indian peoples to prevent. You know, like that—that it, that it becomes something that is so far away, so distant from your own ind indigenous peoples that you cannot even recognize it anymore. Um, so, I highly recommend people, and that is why I, I wanted to have uh, um, Brandon on on on, the, on on this deep dive. And, and yeah, I think uh, I just got have a feeling that it will be one of many conversations. Uh, but I just didn't want to give you a taste. Like a two and a half, two three hour taste, I would say. Um, <laughs> big taste, big taste. Yeah, it's like, it's like a uh, not just steak and potatoes, but like a big, big side dish, I would say. Yeah. Um, of of what nation Hawaii, Hawaii is. Um, how do you want to? This is all you because because this uh, um, um, nation of Hawaii is such a concept. Sorry, I shouldn't call it a concept. Um, an act of self-determination that, um, yeah, I don't know where to start. So uh, how do, again, um, how, what the first question would be. So by all means, uh, Brandon, um, I can jump how, in. How, you wanna, how do you want to, yeah, jump in, please. Yeah. Okay. So, um, of course, um, for people that don't uh, know the history of Hawaii, I, I would suggest mm. you Google some of that and, and, and learn some of that. But, um, you know, I'll give you like a little brief history about what happened to us and and then I'll go right into where the nation of Hawaii takes off. So in 1893, um, Hawaii was an independent nation. It was it was a uh, it was called the Kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands. And, um, you know, we had a monarch and then and that monarch uh, was Queen Liliuokalani. And uh, before that, our, our our monarchy actually practiced uh, international relations on par with every nation, you know, of the world that was practicing, you know, political diplomacy. You know, we were the first non-European, non-American, meaning non-white nation to belong to the family of nations, which later became the League of Nations, which later became the, um, the United Nations. Mm. Um, so we started to practice diplomacy from early on. So we were our, our, uh, an independent and codified state recognized by nations all over the world. We even recognize other nations, you know? So like we were the first nation to recognize Argentina. We were the first nation to recognize Samoa. And, um, you know, if I did a little bit more research on this stuff, I, I'd probably name a couple other nations, but you know, sure. we're, we, you know, we're, we're, we were a nation. Mm -hmm. In 1893, we were overthrown by, um, by business leaders here in Hawaii, greedy business leaders that that wanted more than what they were having, and so they figured that they would overthrow our queen and get better deals. You know, these guys controlled sugar at that time in Hawaii. Sugar was a big crop. We were the largest producer of sugar in the world at that time. Um, you know, this is before tourism. This is before all of that. We had these these crops, and that's what you know Hawaii was the jewel for sugar and so these sugar barons along with um uh u.s warship so the sugar barons only 13 guys now you know there's 13 people over through our country so the sugar barons and uh, of course with the u.s the help of the u.s warship they overthrew our queen in 1893 and um you know subsequently our queen um 
stepped out of the way because she didn't want bloodshed. She figured that, okay, we had a treaty of friendship with the United States. We've been treaty partners with the United States, economic treaties, all kinds of treaties. We were, we were brother and sister. So she would defer to the president, okay, let this, let this coup happen, let this overthrow happen, and I'll, I'll work it out with President Cleveland. So she does, you know, and they talk story and he's like, no, this is wrong. We need to, we need to restore you to power. During that time, Cleveland is actually going through a re-election. He loses the election. New president comes in, McKinley. McKinley is a colonizer. McKinley, you know, took not just Hawaii, he took Alaska, he took all kinds of different places. You know, this guy was hell-bent on imperialism, American imperialism. So the course of America changed. And so our people were stuck now. We were we were taken over by sugar barons, you know, and and um, we never got let go of, you know. So they started to manipulate the Hawaiian people. They started to try and Americanize us instead of massacre us because our queen didn't give them any excuse to do that. And our queen told us to be peaceful because those these guys will use this against you. You know, back then it was it was a war doctrine. You know, when it comes to diplomacy, if you lost the war, you lost your land. You know, it's not like that anymore. But back then, that was the international law. You know, so she told everybody, stand down. Don't give these guys a reason to, to win our land. So our queen held our sovereignty for us. And it still exists today. Fast forward to 1993. President Clinton is in office. And um, this is 100 years after the illegal overthrow. And we have a Hawaiian governor. And this Hawaiian governor, his name was John Wahee. And he was actually one of the first persons to um, endorse Bill Clinton when he was running for governor. This was right, right after, like, you know, he he came into a scandal. This was on the Monica Lewinsky scandal, but as well, another scandal that this guy was involved in. Our governor was the first one to endorse him. After that, everybody endorsed him. After that, he, he became the Democratic nominee, and then he won. So the, the president never forgot that. And so the governor told him that, you know, he'd like to put through this apology law, you know, apologizing for U.S.'s overthrow and their their involvement in the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii it was wrong, you know, and, and what we were being taught in school was that Hawaii was given to the U.S., you know, this revisionist history taught by the colonizers and the people that, that took us over. That's what we were all taught growing up. The apology bill put that to rest because it said all the things that we know today, which America stole 1.8 million acres of our land without any compensation to our people or without even asking our people. They, they suppressed our sovereignty. They did all these different things. It's all in U.S. Public Law 103. And that was signed on November 23rd. And at the time, my uncle and about 300 Hawaiians was occupying a public beach called Kaupo Beach Park because my uncle was just tired of seeing all his homeless you know, family members and all these homeless kanaka just all over the beaches. So he organized them into one group on Kaupo Beach Park. And when this apology bill came out, Monk was actually a part of the the governor's, Governor John Wahe's Sovereignty Advisory Commission. And so, you know, he was starting to teach all these houses guys about this apology bill because now this turned their occupation into not just us occupying Hawaiian lands because this used to belong to our families, blah, blah, blah. No, we were reoccupying the lands that in the apology bill, the United States said got stolen from us, got passed to the state of Hawaii, and now the state of Hawaii is holding stolen lands. So us being here on this beach park is just a reconciliation that the apology bill promises. You know, so it made us more like pot up to that place, more stuck to that place. The cops didn't know what to do. The state of Hawaii didn't know what to do because this law is federal. This mm. is about them. And so my uncle, you know, being on the Sovereignty Advisory Commission, he was tasked with understanding the international law part. And, and he was supposed to, you know, get an international law expert and bring him to Hawaii and explain to them what the what this now means. So he brought in this international attorney called Francis Boyle. Now, Francis Boyle, he has helped um, many nations, many, many places fighting injustice. Um, he, he was Yasser Arafat's legal advisor. He helped the Palestinian people create their declaration of independence. You know, so he was into occupation. He was against imperialism. 
and um, he was a professor out of the University of Illinois. He came to Hawaii because my uncle told him to come to Hawaii and the state of Hawaii paid for him to come to give a presentation on what the apology bill means. Hmm. Francis Boyle said that, you know, at, at this um, Mabel Smite Auditorium with about a thousand people in the audience, he said, now that I've read the apology bill, what this now, you know, clearly states to me is that America has finally apologized for the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom and the Hawaiian people can now restore their independence. You know, he said that in that in that auditorium and, and the place almost blew up. You know, it was like everybody was so excited, so happy. You know, it was it was just a confirmation of things that, you know, we all been fighting for an acknowledgement like that. And you know how big these documents are, Ghazali. You know, these yeah. you know, these this these laws, they're, they're not just like, oh, this is Bruno Mars Day or this is Brandon. <laughs> You know, give you the key to the city and all that. This is not ceremonial. Mm. People are admitting in their own words, in whereas clauses, that they've done all these things and that they, there will be a reconciliation process. Now, the catch is they don't tell you when that reconciliation. Yeah. Mm. The catch is this is not used to settle any claims also, you know. But what Francis Boyle told us was that, you know, it doesn't settle any claims, but it does say that reconciliation and claims are forthcoming you know this mm. is not beginning and end this is just the beginning it starts here when you negotiate and, and when you have to come to an agreement with something you have to start at a foundation our foundation is at the apology law because it's there you know we're not we're not we don't use kingdom law we don't use any kind of law that that america has already ignored and trampled over you know although it it, it it's you know it under certain terms, under international law, yeah, they never extinguished the Hawaiian kingdom. The kingdom law should be the law of the land today. It's not happening today. We got to, mm. this in the context of reality. They're not going to acknowledge those laws. So what do we do? We have to use their laws against them. You know, and so that is what my uncle taught everybody at Kaupo. And so he used that to organize those people. And they stayed there for 15 months. He had hundreds of people down there all talking about the law, all outside on Kaupo Beach Park, protesting, talking about the illegal occupation on their lands, on state lands. And, and you know, they had something that a lot of Hawaiians never did have before since the overthrow, which was leverage. They had mm. the political leverage. They had the people. They had the law on their side, especially. And, and so the state was stuck. They couldn't do anything. Well, you know, at the end of this 15 months, the, the the occupation grew to like, you know, almost 400 people. And, you know, when you get that much people, not everybody is on the same page with you. Not everybody is there for the right intention. You're going to get agitators come. You're going to get all these guys coming in to try and disrupt the movement. And my uncle could feel that. And so, you know, he came to the agreement and he came to the realization that, we're going to have to probably end this occupation soon, but we cannot end it while being empty-handed. My, my uncle occupied Makapu Lighthouse back in 1987, and that was a two-month occupation with just his family. And when they came in and the SWAT team came in and arrested everybody, including the kids and clotheslining everybody, they walked away with a bill. You know, they didn't get anything from that. They, they, they had to pay bail, they had to pay court fees, all that big learning experience for my uncle. So... In 1993, he knew we're not just going to get arrested and that's how this occupation would end. We've got to end it on our terms. You know, so he came up to an agreement with the state that they would give him 45 acres of, again, state stolen lands, our stolen lands, in exchange for him leaving Kaupo Beach. And so Monko took the deal, you know. And, and it was a controversial thing at the time. You know, everybody, they didn't believe he would take the deal. They, you know, they thought my uncle was going to fight them all the way. And so did my uncle. And so, you know, they started calling him on sellout. They started calling him, like, every name in the book. And my uncle just was thinking that, you know, if we ever going to get anything, we got to leverage this opportunity and get something so that we can, you know, establish something in one secure area. You know, mm. being out on that beach park, is good for exposure, but that's not one place for raise one family. That's not one place for develop one, you know, one, 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 one new social system. That's, 
you know, you, you're just asking for heat. That's staying on one front line protest for the rest of your life. You know, that's not sustainable. That's going to burn plenty of people out and it's going to be a dangerous situation. And so my uncle made the deal with the state. And now what he had to do is convince his people to now move, which was the hardest thing, because you just didn't convince all these people to stay here and to come here and to organize here. Now you got to convince them to leave. And so it was a tough decision, but my uncle was able to convince everybody that, you know, in the long run, this is going to be in a better situation for us. So when, when at the end of the 15 months, with the help of the state, we moved, we started to move all our structures up to Puhonu Waimanalo. See, the state, they got worried when we started to build structures at the beach park. We started to build buildings, bathrooms, meeting rooms, all these kinds of stuff right on beach park property. You know, and the state couldn't do nothing about it. And they started to worry, you know. And so that's what pushed the state to the table. It was that kind of things, you know, getting, getting, you know, putting it in these guys' faces that, no, you know, this is our land. Well, why we got to keep asking you for permission? You already, this, you already said this is our land. So we're not going to ask anymore. We're just going to do them. And the act of pressuring them like that got them to the table and got them to offer up these lands where we are today. So 27 years later, we're at Pu'ohonoa, Waimanao. That occupation from Kaupo moved up to Pu'ohonoa, where we was able to turn those tents that was occupying that beach into houses. You know, we was able to turn all those protest signs into lives for people where they could build and farm and, and you know, do all these things we're trying to do today. Like like you said, you know, this this sort of utopian type of living, which was just the way all indigenous peoples used to live, free from, you know, this outside oppression. That's what, you know, that's, that's crazy that that is utopia for us. We're so used to living in oppression that just not having that oppression is is the finish line, you know? And so, you know, that's our story in how we took and we leveraged, you know, frontline action, frontline stuff that everybody is doing right now into the establishment of a dream we have for all of Hawaii. You know, mm. this, this Pu'ohono is the example. When people talk about, Oh, Hawaii cannot be independent again. Oh, you guys are always gonna need the US. You guys, you know, you guys gonna be dependent on them all until you die because you don't know what to do. You don't have your own money, you don't have this, you don't have that. We're proving them wrong right now in Puhono Waimanawa. Every day, with every innovation we create, with every solution, with every technology that we bring in, that we get to cut off our reliance on the state of Hawaii and we rely on ourselves. Every day that's a sovereign act, and every day. We're building capacity to show everybody in the world that indigenous peoples can be independent again, and they will be independent again. It's just a matter of time. It takes one, but then that 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 snowballs and that momentum goes out, and we use social media to to you know taunt that out there. We we put that out there so that everybody can you know understand that this is like not just about Hawaiians. This is about all indigenous peoples. We just somebody out there kind of sharing our role in how we got there. Mm. Why do you think then, because it is such a, um, and props props to that, and big shout out to um, your uncle, uh, Bumpy Kanahele, uh, for having the foresight, the, the vision uh, of, of, and the, um, yeah, like knowing what to do. And like that, you need some leverage. That that you uh, you have the opportunity right now. So you need to get get something to get to build something out of. You know, like and land is super important for for Indi indigenous peoples. Um, like if I would, and if I'm not a native Hawaiian, I'll never be. I'll, 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 I'm I'm just a, a huge supporter for, of nation of Hawaii and the 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 Hawaiian struggle for independence. Um. I would, what I would do is like, all right, hey, this is what's happening in 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 Waimanalo. Um, I would do the same in on Hilo or Big Island or, or whatever. Is it is that happening or is it is there or is there some yeah I don't know like hesitation uh, around that? Well, there's hesitation because it's like. It's not an easy thing to do, right? It's not an easy thing to motivate people to go occupy land, especially in this day and age today. Mm. You know, and and 
what they also did was make an example out of my uncle. You know, when our nation started and, and our kupunas created our constitution and we moved forward with, you know, doing all these, um, uh, you know, ass asserting our sovereignty, we were starting to like, you know, tell the cops like, you know, you guys are, you know, violating human rights. You guys are violating our human rights. You guys are violating, you know, you guys are committing genocide against us. When, once my uncle started to organize people and started to do things like that, he got put on a list and, and there was a list to get taken out of, you know, it mm. was like, we got to get this guy off the streets. And that's what they did. They came after my uncle in 1995 and they arrested my uncle and they put him away without bail. You know, so he was in prison without bail for 10 months, not knowing what was going to happen to him, not knowing the charges, not knowing anything. They took him off the streets, you know, and, and, and I think a lot of people see that kind of stuff and, and they don't want to cross that line. You know, they're afraid they, they, these guys made an example out of my uncle and my uncle got out of the situation and, and, and he's a, you know, he had to do his time. He had to, he had to, you know, go, they had to monitor him with an ankle bracelet, all kind of different stuff, you know, but, he was out and he, he was doing his thing, but we never came back to that strength that we had in 95 when everything was going because like, nobody could stop us. They had to illegally arrest my uncle to stifle our movement so that we we don't take over everything, you know, because mm -hmm. we was giving everybody the game plan on how you do this. So by them taking out my uncle was kind of like, okay, you guys, Bumpy did that. You guys they end up like him, you know, and that, kind of like stunted the growth of our people they saw that and like oh okay i guess i guess the apology law doesn't work i guess we gotta rethink how we're gonna do things so our people became more you know we started to go back to school learning our rights all these different things but we didn't evolve from that time you mm -hmm. know we stayed too long in the school we stayed too long trying to work the system from the inside you know do all these other things so that you know, come today, everybody thinking, oh, why didn't we all do that at that time? You, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that easy when, you know, you got pressured and, and, you know, people came in and told you, don't even think about doing that. You know, unless you like end up in jail with Bumpy, don't even try that, mm -hmm. you know. So that's why I think those kinds of things didn't happen. It's not like it can't happen again today. It's, it can happen uh, for sure. You know, but you got to have your stuff together. You got to have your leverage points well figured out. You got to have your political backers. You got to have your economic backers. All these things that we didn't have that we can look back on hindsight and see, like, you know, how could we do this again? You know, we, we get the playbook today. It's just mm. that somebody got to take that shot. You know, somebody got to do that, you know, and not everybody does sovereignty full time. You know, especially not in Hawaii. The sovereignty is not a paid occupation. Me and my uncle do this for free. You know, we don't get paid. We're lucky we get good wives that get good, you know, support <laughs> us all the way. You know, that, that's the guys carrying the nation is the wives and the spouses. You know, they, they, they're the real heroes right now, you know, because mm -hmm. they allow me and my uncle to just keep pushing because, you know, not being tied down and not being attached politically or attached to this grant or attached to any organization allows us to just move in the right direction. You know, it's not going to, it doesn't alter us because, you know, if it's wrong, we just shut down and get out of there. You know, it, it doesn't hurt us. We, we, you know, we just keep going. But I think that is the issue. And not a lot of people have that freedom. Everybody's attached. Everybody get baggage. Everybody's, you know, like anything, I'm not saying we special, but we, it's it's it takes a special person to be able to do those things and then organize enough people to do that too. Because no more that much people are willing to do what my uncle did a long time ago, let, let alone 500 people, because that's the kind of numbers it's going to take in order to do what we did today. You know, mm. you're going to occupy with numbers, you know, not just 10 hardcore guys and, and, and their families. It's going to take a lot more than that. How many people live in Nation of Hawaii um, today? Do, um, so that people have an idea. Um, right now we got about maybe eighty-five to ninety people, mm. you know, twenty households. Yeah, yeah. And because um, that that is because I remember there was somebody said once um, that 
Um, I think I remember there was some discussion within the printer forum in, in New York a long time ago. And somebody said, uh, like, you can say a lot about nation of Hawaii, but they have land. They have their own, they have their own land and they're cultivating it in a way as in like they're building a nation. Whereas a lot of other movements um, or uh, yeah, you can call them movements are just because Hawaii has a lot of movements, you know, it has as the, it is, um, I've been attacked um, multiple times by, 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 by one or two movements in, in Hawaii. Um, Principality of Aloha is, is one of them. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Oh man. It was, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't even attacked. It was, it was, they even tried to sue me or something like that. Or like at least give the indication that they weren't, well, were going to sue me with, 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 with damages. Like, yeah, you, now you have to pay for a couple thousand dollars in, 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 in lawyer fees and in and, and flights and everything else. And that was during the whole World Commerce thing. I was like, what the hell is going on? Um, and that's, that's why one of the things that, that confused me a little bit is um, that the, um, like many movement, uh, Indigenous independence movements, it's, it's so, so fragmented as, as in there's so many. Um, and yeah, so Prince Valley of Aloha was one and then, Kingdom of, Kingdom of Atui was one as well. That that, um, but yeah, it was, um, yeah. We should, probably should not talk too much about it because then I'll just go into the the, the negative spiral <laughs> of, the, of the conversation. Uh, whereas I would just want to keep it like yeah, uh, motivating and, and empowering because the whole nation of Hawaii story is 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 like I said is a is maybe maybe utopian one is not a good one because I mean, utopia g gives you an idea that it is almost unreachable right whereas um you can see actually because what i love about about what you because you're documenting you and 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 uncle bumpy and every everyone else in in the nation of hawaii you're documenting through on, on yeah live streams and, and everything else you're documenting your building a nation and that is what i appreciate so much because it is it is what you see is what you get you know and and, uh, and it is what i am super curious about is um as maybe it'll, it's like a like a clubhouse thing that you, you you come into the conversation halfway that you forget the that you miss out on the first part which is most a lot of times the most important part is like why you do it like what what is the vision that you have um does this can you share uh, um, um, the vision that you have? Well, uh, that you have, and or Uncle Bumpy has. Yeah, well, it's basically you know, of course we advocate for independence, right? And, and mm -hmm. that has evolved over the years from, you know, basically you know just being a purely political thing, to evolving to like more of a economic social thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think today our vision is. We're not trying to challenge the U.S. or the state of Hawaii anymore. That's not, you know, that's not part of our journey. What we're trying to do is create a better system for our people to, to live in, you know. So not even, you know, just like how they ignored us all these years, we're going to begin to ignore them. We're going to begin pulling out of their system and plugging into our system, you know. So it's, it's this double-edged sword of attack on the oppressive system because whether we know it or not whether we like it or not we contribute to our own oppression by using their banks by using their stores by buying from their companies by buying all these different things it's the same kind of deal with like the black panthers and the nation of islam they went economics you know mm -hmm. they they organized their own stores they organized their own businesses and they began to consolidate power in that in that instance and for us yeah we sort of around that same idea of, you know what, everything that we live in life today, we dependent on the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And we're here telling them that the U.S., you know, needs to go and all that. But if they do go, what's going to happen? You know, what, 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 what does society break down? Because it sure seems like it if we get everything from them. Yeah. So what we have to do is every single day we have to figure out a way to transition ourselves 
out of dependency and into independence. You know, mm. so we have to in everything we do, where we buy our food at, where we get our internet from, where we buy our clothes, where we build our houses, where we get our health care from. All of these things need to be built. And these things that are being built without the help of the state of Hawaii, without the help of the United States, through our efforts, through our business ventures, through our economic pushes, through our supporters, is the new sovereignty we're talking about today. This mm. is what can be achieved today because this is the free enterprise that we live in in the U.S. You know, maybe it can't happen for everybody around the world. Maybe this is a, just a U.S. centric solution, but it's this idea of breaking the dependency on the oppressive system and investing in our own independence by creating our own independent solutions for everything. And that is the vision today. Now, moving all of our people out of that and into our system is going to take time, but with technology, with all these different innovations coming online, like cryptocurrencies like blockchain technology we can do that we can have our own currency our own digital currency and we do it's called aloha dollar mm -hmm. you know, and we have uh, in the works uh, a blockchain technology to have our own elections so that we don't need state-sponsored elections where they can control what happens and they dictate to you whether you're going to be federally recognized or not we don't need that kind of stuff. We, we're going to build it ourselves, not going to be convoluted with OHA or, or anybody else. This is coming from our nation. And, and this these are all sovereign actions. It's all about now gathering resources to move forward. We, tie, we're not, we don't need to ask anymore. Nobody can get arrested doing this. These are all legal ventures that everybody can do. It just takes resources. Yeah. You know? Not saying that like resources is easy to come about. That's always the hardest thing to do. But now we don't need to concentrate on so much different things and, and doing all these reactionary, you know, protests or reactionary uh, moves. We can just head down the, the pathway of, okay, how can we get more economic resources? How can we link up with people that will support us? How can we find technology and innovative people to come here and to give us their technology for free and help us in exchange for us guys letting you observe and gather data you know mm. um or let's unpack that a little bit because there's so many things that you touched upon that um are can be very intriguing um first you touch first you touched upon like the economic aspect of, of things um two things come to mind um one is is what i used to is it now aloha dollar or is it what was it is it because i used to know it as aloha coin oh we have aloha coin in japan and then in, in the, what we're developing um with our partners in spain for for europe and and the u.s is aloha dollar all right all and right we have so, different cryptocurrencies going right now it's kind of confusing but it's 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 the same you know same okay yeah yeah. Uh, so, so, um, because that is something that it is an emerging thing, right? You, we, people know Bitcoin and and all the others, cryptocurrencies, um, but like in, in terms of in, indigenous uh, currency, um, I don't see that often. Uh, like the, uh, the only thing that I know, and with my limited knowledge, uh, is yeah, that what I've seen surface is in terms of crypto crypt, cryptocurrency is uh, is Aloha coin or Aloha dollar, um. So obviously, like sovereignty and independence was the driver towards it. And um, how what was it like like you 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 woke up one day and it's like, oh yeah, um let, let's do this. Like how did that process develop from idea to like actually having a um a a, a crypto dollar or a coin? Right. Well, it's it was somebody coming to us, you know, like 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 how a lot of different opportunities came to us, and they wanted to like test out their technology. They wanted to mm. how creating um, uh, an independent currency for an indigenous nation. Well, how would that help them? You know, and so we hooked up with these guys in Japan first and started doing a loan coin. You know, way back in 2015. And that has its own path that it's going on too. And then, you know, we linked up with these guys from Spain maybe about a year or two ago. And now we have Aloha Dollar going. So it's, you know, it's not just 
you know, us knowing all these different things. So who, who can know all of these things when, you know, it's, it's almost impossible. But when you, when you build up, you know, um, a network and, 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 you know, start working with more people, you know, they, they just come to you with ideas sometimes, you know, they just come to you and, and, you know, like for us, the guy that created Aloha Coin, what got him interested in wanting to help us is he saw the movie Aloha with mm. Uncle Bobby. And, and that was, that's like, that became his favorite movie. He would watch him like once every day, you know, like he was a big fan of Uncle Bumpy's. And so that's how Aloha Coin was created because somebody heard our story and was infatuated and wanted to do their part. And, and normally, you know, you would think, ah, you know, the only way you can help is donate money or, you know, donate lumber or, you know, all these things. Who would have thought somebody would come and donate their time and their expertise in creating a cryptocurrency and that that would be a key for us guys moving forward with sovereignty, mm. you know, and, and for the people that, you know, heard of Bitcoin and all of that and heard of cryptocurrencies and not understanding the correlation between sovereignty and cryptocurrency, it's all about, you know, what value system your nation is operating on and what kind of currency it is and what what is that currency backed by and what what is what is the intention of that currency you know and right now the dollar you know is a means to an end for our people so that we could survive in this world but it's really not the economy that our people used to have on the Ahubwa system long ago hmm. we had a trade and barter system like almost every indigenous person out there right but today we live in a in a world where you know technology and all that you cannot go trade and barter, um, Kahlo for for buy your daughter's prom dress, right? <laughs> so you got to figure out a medium, right? And so today that medium is dollars. So guys is taking that Kahlo, taking it to the the market, selling it, getting that cash, and then that cash goes to, towards that dress. Yeah. What, what we're saying is that our Aloha coin or Aloha dollar is is actually an indigenous economy again. And we're just using, you know, the the dollars and the cryptocurrency as a way to, you know, set values so that you can trade and barter in real time, you know, but you know, like like the what made money more um usable is, you know, when you harvest like a hundred acres of Kahlo. There's a time limit in how long that is gonna be at that certain price. The longer it waits, the 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 decrease price starts to happen because stuff starts to spoil, you lose buyers and all that. It doesn't it doesn't age well. You cannot put Kahlo in one bank, but with cryptocurrency you can. You know, and so it's it's us going back to an older um economy. You know, it's mm -hmm. trade and barter again, it's just counted a different way. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 such a a um. I first heard it uh, when I well, uh, was at the Nation of Hawaii that it intrigued me actually. Actually, as an as an it, it is a way of stepping outside of the um the system in a way because because yep. you know like you 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 were it is um because a lot of in Indian people talk about independence and talk about sovereignty, um but it's still within the framework within the tunnel vision of um the reigning system that 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 is uh, um controlling us and the way that i saw you the nation of hawaii uh, you and uncle uncle bumpy like start starting to do things bits and pieces like yeah it, it, it all fits within it requires a a an imagination that is <laughs> that, that that's Little, literally, yeah. uh, um, of uh, yeah, it, it, a high level of imagination of like of, of sovereign state of mind, yeah, uh, independent state of mind. Um, whereas I, I do, do meet a lot of indigenous peoples, and I was part of, I was one of them as well. Um, that the idea of independence was all right, um, being able to uh, uh <coughs> become a nation similar to i don't know norway or or, or turkey you know or like those countries that you have a, a parliament and everything else like and that was my idea of independence but it is so unnatural to indigenous sovereignty because it is like we had our own governance system 
uh, like you said, barter system. We, we used that before, lands. And why not? And, and, and that is and this is where I was at at, at some point. So moving from um, the old way of thinking about independence towards, all right, let, let's do um, an indigenous form of independence. But what you're doing, that, that's why I call it Sovereignty 2.0, because you are embracing like um, blockchain, like to 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 break away from 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 everything and um, everything that is. Um, that, that's why I, well, why I'm so interested in picking your brain because like it's almost like you look at something, you're like an engineer, an inventor. You look at something like, all right, how can we make this independent? Right. And that 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 is what intri- intrigues me, and that is why I yeah um I'm supposed to be coming out with a question on this one, but it's just pure appreciation and and uh, for for what what's um, what you're doing over there, at the nation of Hawaii. Well, you know what you know what you know what we like to think of it as you know it's kind of like um we like to think about what our kupuna was doing right uh, you know maybe three hundred years ago. And put ourselves in that place, you know. And then, what if the overthrow didn't happen? You know, what if, what if, what if even our monarchy and our kingdom nice. never? You know, how would our ancient people live in today's world? You know, how would they take technology and use it in the Ahupua? You know, not 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 get confused with what system you're operating under now, because all I like to do is instead of me digging that with my hand. I can get a machine and dig that with a machine, you know, and that's our mentality today. We have that mindset of, you know what, how would they use that? Because these were the innovative people that we're trying to be like. We're trying to be like them 300 years ago. We're not trying to be like these super, you know, technological, you know, techno, um, you know, technocrats, you know, we're not, you know, but we have an example of, of how society, you know, ran, which was almost perfect. And we have that example in our DNA and we're putting ourselves and our mindsets there. And we're living in this world with that mindset. How do I use this? How do I use this computer? How do I use this phone? How do I use, you know, blockchain technology to, to trade and barter my fish for my column? You know, and 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 kind of keep it in that line, so we don't get all confused with, oh, uh, you know, this is just technology that you wouldn't have had, and you know, you should be thankful that the U.S. and blah blah, you know, all those pitfalls that we usually run into and that slow us down. Take all that out of our minds, you know, whether or not our kupuna would use this, you know, that's that's wrong. They wouldn't be digging that with one, you know, the kind of excavator. They they would dig that all by hand. No, you don't know that. You don't know if they would be digging. I, I bet you money our kupuna wouldn't be digging this by hand. We evolved every time. Our, our, our techniques got even better over the years. You know, So what they was doing in 1200 was not the same planting style they did in 1700. So if we remove all that pilikia that happened in the 1800s and the 1900s, our people would have advanced to this supremacy, you know, technological supremacy today. That's... Mm reaching back to and that's what we channel and that's the mindset that we come at this issue now you know we don't look for problems we look for solutions and all we see is solutions we see a crumbling system and we see a, a an opportunity to take advantage of that you know not to sound sinister or anything but that is our idea you know we look at chaos as somewhere where we can bring back these systems that used to work before because obviously your system is failing Mm. And how do you, um, like, where do you get you your the because because you're you're looking back right like to the kupunas like how how they did, um, is it, uh, yeah like how how do you how do you look back you know like and and try to figure that out because like obviously they're not amongst us anymore, um, so so that people that want to follow your because this is why i'm asking so the people that want to follow your your path in a way because what you're saying is all right let, let, let's let's see how they did before and you know you know and is it um well what are the ways that that you uh can talk about um that you used 
to go back to like the ways of the kapunas and um, the, the ways that are, that are sorry kapunas our ancestors how, how they did um so that others can um have, have a little bit of idea right of how to do it the same well you know i mean of course books you know and and our own written history and and whatever we can gather from that which of course you got to take it with a grain of salt. And a lot of that is colonized information and, and, and whitewashed. And, you know, it's not as advanced as it used to be because they didn't want to show the advancements of our people. But, you know, I think it's it's in our it's in our songs. It's in our dance. It's in our chants. You know, these are these are where we pick these stories up from, you know, like the Ahupuaa, you know, these concepts, these ideas that that are being taught to us as like oh this is how good it was before you know they talk about it like it's history before it's not history to us it's it's a goal now to us we switch it around on them you know they talk about how these valleys used to thrive in in you know in you know in on the continent and how how these these plains used to thrive and all that and and they talk about them like that's ancient history and that'll never come back mm. we that we take all those stories and we, we, we try and see how do we bring that back as impossible as it may seem. We got to take that impossibility out of our mind and just reconstruct it. Like you said, we're like engineers, right? How do you deconstruct this, this monstrosity that they put on this, this, you know, this fine tuned machine that we created thousands of years ago? How do we take this ugly crap off and bring back this old crap? you know, as, as efficiently as possible. So it's, you know, digging into our history, I thought just admiring it, but looking for clues, looking for clues of how the water used to run, you know, in our lands and, and how, what was the most, um, what was the most uh, fruit giving plant in these plains? What was the most, you know, the, these are all things that people can find today. And also, you got to sit down and, and include your kupuna and your ancestors in, in this decision-making process. You know, we cannot just be the guys blazing this trail without any sort of guidance. Mm. You know, this is where my uncle plays a big role in this because that's his whole MO. He was guided by the kupuna. He was guided by his ancestors. You know, our kupuna that, that appointed him head of state of the nation of Hawaii, the people that created our constitution, they put a lot of manao and their ideas and their dreams and their visions in him. So he's this walking receptacle of thousands of kupuna's dreams and aspirations. And so his whole intention and his whole motivation is to make these dreams happen, even if this kupuna is no longer here. And so his stories lead us in a lot of different avenues, you know, some Things that we know can see, things that that you know normally would be pitfalls for us, where we would get distracted and we would chase the money. He keeps us on track. So having Kupuna around, leading your movement and leading your nation and leading the, the future is very vital. We cannot leave them out because they have the key to the success of your society. It's not us, it's them. Hmm. It is something that that comes to my mind. Actually, I, I like to play with words because uh, we're talking about nation, nation of Hawaii, and that you have to use you have to use your imagination. But you, you guys, what, this is what Indigenous peoples in the Indigenous world needs more is people that have a certain vision, you know, like like the, the, the vision or imagination. Dare to imagine, because yeah. you need to have the quote unquote the cojones, the balls you know, to, to to dare to imagine, to think beyond the parameters that have been set by the colonizers. Right. In this in this case, the United States. And not just like, oh, there's an idea and just write it down or like try to make a make a nice poster out of it or a statement at the permanent forum or whatever and just leave it at that. You know, but it is it is more than that. It is about putting that idea and and putting it into work. You know, so like, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's something that pop, popped in my mind into like, you, you we, the world needs, and these people need more indigenous imagineers, like that, it's like Disney, right? Like you, you yep. see something and you create it, you know, like you engineer it. And that is what um, I'd like to see more. And, and uh, this is, so, in, in terms of 
inspiration and empowerment. This is this is really the, the, the story that needs to be amplified more and more and more around the world. And not just like, and it's it's, it's true. Like human rights violations are happening. That, that like you cannot. Uh, this should be addressed. Anything, but in anything, people need inspiration. People need something that they can look forward to, like that they can build towards. You know, and that is and it's something that 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 that, that um, make them lose the shackles. You know, like they're like, yeah, I finally, I'm I'm free. I'm, I'm I can be independent, and it's. And this is what my observation in the indigenous world is, is that a lot of people, like, they go in with good intentions and they either lose motivation or they lose, um, yeah, like, they they lose patience Mm. and they become pragmatic. Mm. Like, you know, like, these are the parameters, so let me just, like, try to find the, the 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 like not yeah the middle of it or just a little bit the the edges of it instead of like all right let's let's master the system and use it to in into our for our advantage super um super um intrigued by by w- what you're doing you touched upon something that um several times is the ahabua and i think that is something that, uh, um, yeah, I'm super interested in, um, and I think many of indigenous peoples interested in it. Well, because it, it's such a uh, fundamental part of why you do what you do. If 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 I if I listen to you correctly, can you explain a little bit like w- w- what it is in in your in your view? It doesn't have to be like a scientific blah 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 blah, but but just like in in your view. What, yeah. what it is no perfect um so the ahupua system is a land division in ancient hawaii um that our communities were split up you know every island was split up in these different ahupua um and every ahupua had a mountain and ocean region the ahupua had their own like plains areas to grow food every ahupua had you know it was basically like when you split stuff up for your kids right and and you know you give everybody the exact same thing you know or else somebody gonna fight with somebody you know exact same idea and concept with the ahupua you kind of just give all your fish ponds to waimanalo and you have none for kailua you're gonna have one war eventually over fish ponds right so you give everybody the equal amount right everybody gets a fish pond everybody gets a mountain region everybody gets a plain areas and so everything was equitable. Every community had the opportunity to be just as strong as every other community. You know, maybe not at, at the same level. You know, we have different fish, different planting styles, different elevations. But it was that idea that every community was pretty equal. And the other key to the Ahupua was that the, the water would be the connector between the mountain and ocean. And the water was the most important asset in the Ahupua because the water fed everybody's um, grow beds, their 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 lands, their their taro fields, and then it fed into the you know the fisheries, into the the ponds. So you know that all was free. You know nobody got charged for the water. Everybody utilized the water, and everybody had to share the water. So you couldn't have somebody at the top cutting off the water and 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 creating their own little dam and then you start selling that water that never did happen in Aupua because people would go up there uh mainly the konahiki or the guy that watches over he would call him the chief he would go up there and clear that dam out and, and make sure that everything was flowing because this was the the order of things you know this is the system and this whole idea of sharing in the resource so that everybody can benefit Everybody has access to this resource. Everybody has an opportunity to create their own farm, to create their own, you know, prosperity and not be controlled from the top is the whole concept behind the Ahupua system. It was a society that was built to share, you know, and, and it's different. It's different today in capitalism and all that, you know, in, in a capitalistic Ahupua you would see the guy at the top controlling everything, trickling down the water to his friends and the people that paid him off. 
it would look dead. It would look all dried up. It wouldn't look natural. It would be it would be too much human involvement and too much uh, control. Whereas our ahupua was constructed by nature. We were just these guys that that blended into nature. Where we built our houses wasn't where the low lying areas was. wasn't on the beach. You know, it was up away, away from the river and away from the stream, away from the operations of everything that was going on in the land. You know, we were closer to um, how animals lived, right? But people think that that's barbaric, but that's actually the most intelligent way to live. You know, you, 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 was, um, you blended in. You know, the, the ego of our people wasn't to the point where we wanted to control everything on earth. We just wanted to you know live as good as the fish live we wanted to live as good as the pigs live everybody was living a good life you know we needed a little bit more you know things to have our lives be good housing and all that but you know we was just trying to blend in with nature so it's this system that is set up by nature that nature dictates to you know so that's that's that whole idea with the streams and why you don't dam up the streams why you let the streams flow and why you position your farms around the streams mm. you know it's it's a system that that will never um can never be destroyed because it's a natural system it's it's a system that's more nature than man you know so it's that kind of sophistication our people had where we found the middle ground how do we adapt and how do we prosper while utilizing nature at its best you know we were just you know it's like having a fine you know like a sports car and you know you don't like mess with it you let it do its thing and that's the same thing how we you know refine the ahupua system and i think all indigenous peoples had similar types of systems and and the way we get back to doing those things and getting back to those systems is we have to change the way we do things today mm. meaning like you know when we have opportunities we have to learn how to share how do, how do we distribute this to to the people all the way downstream, farthest from the, the mouth of the stream, you know? And so we think about everything like that. We, we have this saying called Ahupua economics. You know, like people talk about trickle-down economics. Well, Ahupua economics is what they want to believe trickle-down economics is, you know, that the rich guys will start helping everybody down low. They mm -hmm. consider rich guys the first guys at the top of the river. We consider the rich guys everybody that is putting in the hardest work to utilize the river. So it doesn't matter if you're at the top or if you're at the bottom. Anybody can be rich. And so we have to keep that channel open. We have to keep that flow open. We have to make sure that when we have opportunities, we don't hoard, we don't take everything. We take just enough to make our business operate, and then we pass everything downstream. You know, and that's a concept. The Ahupua concept and the Ahupua mindset and economic system that we think everybody in indigenous country and all over the world can can um, adapt to and utilize because it's work. It's proven to work. It's it's you know it wasn't just certain few people had all the money and the wealth in Hawaii because of the way the Ahupua was. Everybody on the land had wealth. You know it just wasn't equated and, and it wasn't gained the same way that people gain wealth today. Today it's speculative. You know, people people get something and they exploit it to its extreme and that's how they create wealth. For us, we find things and then we share it with everybody, but we get to be a part of it because everybody else is doing the exact same thing. It's it's um it's the opposite of fear. Mm. The economy that is driven today is all about fear. It's all about exploitation. Our economy ran on aloha, which is the opposite of fear, which is to share, which is to help. Because it, in, in the sharing, we we um, enshrine and we make sure that our future generations will be taken care of. We never had life insurance. We knew that if our keiki lived in the same ahupua and just did exactly what we did, that's the life insurance policy we leave to them. You know, they got to put out. Just like everybody else, just like I did. You know, my kiki got to do the same. It's fair. It's equitive, you know. Hmm. It is. Do you, um, what is, as a, it is, is a, is a, um, a framework, a strategy, or a way of living, um, are there still elements of it existent right now, uh, in Hawaii? 
Um, there, there are there are places, you know, like our village, of course. But um, yeah, there are, obviously, there are like you know outer island places where where the farmers um, trade with the fishermen, you know, and there are places that the communities um, keep their economy within their economy. But that's obviously on like the neighbor islands, the outside islands, mm-hmm. you know, by parts of Big Island, parts of Kauai. Um, but you know, it's not prevalent because people. Again, people operate out of fear today. And the whole yeah. problem is you have to trust a lot of people. You know, you don't want to be the first guy trusting and everybody just take advantage of you. That's the fear, right? Yeah. Nobody yeah. Understands, like, in order for this system to begin, we have to begin to trust each other. We have to have faith. We have to have loyalty. We have to understand that, you know, the only way we're going to get through this is together, not by ourselves, not when we control the whole market, but it's when we share all our resources together. And it builds strength and resiliency in our community, not just in myself and my own family. Mm. So there are places like that, but they're small and very few. And, um, you know, what we're trying to do in our nation is branch that out because, you know, today the Ahupua will be hard to reconstruct because of development, because of all these different things. You know, it's, it's almost impossible. You know, the rivers don't run to the ocean anymore. They're very few, you know, but the idea and the concept of connecting to each other, right? So if I was in the Waimanalo Ahupua and I was a kalo farmer and I needed fish, I wouldn't go to Kailua and go get fish. I would go see the person in my Ahupua. Why? Because if I train and barter with him, my kalo stays in the community. His fish stays in the community. It circulates. Everybody, you know, there's a benefit to everybody in our trade and transaction. Mm-hmm. Right. So today, um, we even created an app called Exchange Avenue that facilitates trade and barter, and and this we're creating this digital ahupua and this digital community and this digital network between everybody, you know, and and, and trying to figure out ways to to stay connected. Like even our nation with our citizens, one of the first questions we ask our citizens when they sign up to be part of the nation of Hawaii is we want to know. What do you do for work? And what is your what is your passion? What do you what do you like to do? What do you, what are you an expert at? The reason why we ask this is because we want to see not only how much citizens we have, but we want to know how much carpenters we have. We want to know how much mechanics we have. We want to know how much bakers we have. We want to know how much computer analysts we have. Because if I need my car fixed or if I need an extension built on my house, I'm not going to ask anybody else but the citizens of my nation i'm going to ask them and then i'm going to pay them the way you know they want to get paid whether it's cash whether it's a law coin whether it's kalo you know and and that way our we are supporting each other that is the system you know it's not just physical it's us networking with each other creating this communications creating these connections to support everybody it's a resiliency so we build you know, and utilizing online to do that and apps and all of these things. Sorry, Ex- scratching my nose. Right? No, no, yeah, yeah. Sorry, take take your time. Um, yeah. Exchange Avenue. So that that's an app that you that you that you develop. So see, this is what I love. You know, like you you have an idea, create an app so that it accommodates for it. So I also saw something because what you did. It was probably a little while ago, and, and that people could sign up to become uh, um, citizens of of nation of Hawaii. Yep. How did that go? I know how how. Yeah, like like to take us through the process because it's fascinating. Like the the like how what came, what triggered that idea, and how how you how you did that. Um. Well, you know, be, because we're getting closer to our blockchains being finished, where we have a. a our own national currency and then eventually we'll have a blockchain set up specifically for running an election we need to garner up citizens you know we didn't want to do this before because you know we didn't you know it's not like nation of you know kingdom of atui or any other organization you know just having your id with us and then we you know we go with that like oh yeah i get this you know card that says you know, nation of Hawaii, and you know, what does that do? Nothing. Mm. It doesn't give you any kind of you know access or anything. So we don't want to run a citizenship drive until we have something that 
everybody could participate in and, and it was worth something. So we finally did our first citizenship drive in like almost 20 years. And we started it last November and it's still going right now. You know, okay. we it all hooked up and it's running and it's collecting names and, you know, it's not like a huge, huge thing, but you know, every day we get like maybe a person or a couple people or whatever. But you know, so far we've gotten you know about like four hundred people to sign up. Mm. You know, we, you know, for why just you know, and we're not even advertising it. Well, once we start, you know, once these blockchains and and these these things we're developing come online, we're gonna start talking about them even more and promoting it even more and having people sign up more because now you get to do something right. And so, yeah, it, it, it's it's been a good process. You know, we have it on top of um, our website, uh, nationofhawaii.org. So if people go to nationofhawaii.org and they want to join the Nation of Hawaii, they can. It's free. You know, they get to be a part of our nation and you, you'll get like emails and updates. And then eventually you'll be able to to be, um, take part in our economy, take part mm-hmm. in structure take part in our social programs whether you're here in hawaii or whether you're in you know spain or whether you're in europe or whether you're in japan or wherever you are you know we're not limited anymore to the physical world we're building this digital nation now we're building a virtual nation where people can interact people can support people can organize you know especially during covid we figured out so much different ways where we can interact over the internet we have to lean on these things and, and guide this into the future. And so, mm. you know, and that doesn't have any political barriers attached to that. Nobody can stop you from doing that. There's nothing wrong. Hmm. And here I am thinking, so I, I always thought like, cause, cause when I saw the, the post about the citizen drive, I thought, um, no, not thought, I assumed that there was just for people living in Hawaii, native Hawaiians, but like, the way that you describe it, it, it goes beyond that. Yeah, it's people all over the world. We get people from all over the world signing up to be Nation of Hawaii citizens. You know, it's like, um, I don't know if you know the Estonians, but they have e-residency where you can be a citizen of Estonia and, and open a business in Estonia and not even live in Estonia and not have, you know, you, you can be a citizen there, you know, a digital citizen. Is is that like um yeah, yeah Estonia? This is the, the, the funny thing is because I, I I checked there's there's a global ranking of um, countries that are are um, most have adapted the most to um uh, what is it blockchain and it it is I don't know why but it said it said U S was on on the number one spot but Estonia <laughs> is 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 way way beyond that it's it's way more where blockchain is very much almost integrated into the entire governance system and, and and everything else um you are you do you interact a lot with as a nation of hawaii with estonia how yeah. does that go so well every time we um we visit at the unpfii you know of mm-hmm. course we do our thing there but um what we do is we check in with estonia you know with their um We've met their delegation, you know, already three years in a row. Um, yeah. We always meet with, um, her name is Reina Suji. You know, she's a, um, she's the representative that always, um, you know, is the, the one that goes to the UNPFII. So we just check in with her and we let her know what we're doing. You know, obviously, Estonia cannot come out and acknowledge the nation of Hawaii and recognize us. You know, it'd be a huge international incident. But you know, she can, you know, they can help and, and talk story and kind of just, you know, it's mainly on a, on a social thing, you know, not really sure in huge, but you know, we, we, we like to always keep them informed because, you know, we, this is how the kingdom of Hawaii established their diplomatic, you know, relations before back in the day too, you know, we were all Island back then too, you know, and, and, and now today, you know, it's the same story. You know, we're a small island, but we're an emerging nation, and uh, we'd, we'd like to follow nations that are dabbling in the same sector that we are so we can learn from them, you know, the mistakes and the triumphs. And, and you know, and they're very big on their culture over there in Estonia, very cultural really? people, protect their language, they protect their hunting grounds, they protect all these different things. And, um, you know, they had a very similar story to... to um, 
what we're going through currently. You know, they were part of the the European bloc that USSR took over. And so when the USSR fell, Estonia became independent the very next day. But what happened was Estonia was preparing for US, USSR to fall. And they were organizing their, their economics. It was organizing all around these things. And, and when they fell, um, Estonia was ready to go. And what they did was they invested in this thing called the internet. And they invested in technology. And they put all their eggs in that basket. And they said, you know, wherever this is going to go, we're going to let this lead our nation. And we're going to follow this. And, and you know, 20-something years later, they're, they're one of the most, you know, technologically advanced European nations there are. They're very efficient because of blockchain technology. They adopt all these different things because they were built around this idea, you know, of utilizing technology to exercise their sovereignty. Hmm. Yeah, it is. To go, to go back to you, to your point um, about, um, yeah, having the the relationship because that, that's what you're having you have a relationship as a as nation of hawaii with, with estonia and that is um even though um it is very far from international recognition um but there's one element in there that um i'd like to see indigenous people do more which is and i think you have a we have a t-shirt on that is to act sovereign Right. You know, like you don't have to be sovereign to act act sovereign, right? Right. And you just have that nation to nation relationship. You know, it it, it, can, it can very much build up to something. You know, it doesn't have to be directly international recognition or whatever, but it can be come like bits and pieces. You know, like you can you do something for Estonia, something with another country, and another country. Um, yeah, I think. think it, that that is super inspiring. Um, if if you if you um, knowing that you every time you go to the print forum that you you touch base like hey guys this is what we're doing and that that's 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 amazing. Um, it's well it's it's yeah. it's actually de facto recognition, right? It's 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 um it's you know what we like to follow again is like international law, right? And then under international law they have this thing called the Montevideo Convention. Yeah. And what the Montevideo Convention is, is that, you know, to become, to be an independent nation, you don't need to be recognized by the United Nations. You don't need to be recognized by, by um, anybody. The, the way, the, the four pillars of the Montevideo Convention, which is the four pillars of an independent nation, is you have to have a distinct population, fixed territory, um, a functioning government, and you have to exercise international relations. Yeah. Once you're doing these four things, it doesn't matter what anybody says. You are an independent nation. We are doing all four things right now. We have a distinct population. We have a fixed territory. We have a government. And every time we go to the UN, we exercise the international relations. That's it. We fly under the radar and, and we're, 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 we're doing it. We're exercising it. And that's something that, you know, everybody can do. It doesn't need to be worldwide news. It can just be something that's happening, that is developing. That relationship turns into bigger relationships in the future. And, and we yeah. see it already. Yeah, yeah, d d definitely. And it, it is um, funny, funny that you brought up the Montevideo Convention and it, the the, the criteria for for for, um, for statehood because um, right. that, that, that's not a lot not what a lot of indigenous peoples know is that like that that used to be nations or like the, or sorry the, I should say, say differently that are nations and want to regain their independence you know like the like quoting um, or um, bringing up the Montevideo criteria is is super important. Um, because and it is something that I because I was I was um, I was an expert witness in a court case on on, on international law and I brought up the Montevideo Convention as well um, in in the Maluku case and you are absolutely right if I, I would even say that there's instead of four it's there are three because if you have a central government you can already have the ability to go into a government and government um, like right. diplomacy and 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 relationships and. 
what is also interesting um, to indigenous peoples is it could be interesting to, to a lot of indigenous peoples is that if you have a population a and a uh, uh, so population territory and you have or you have or you had so yeah if you had a government and not having a government right now does not uh, void the existence of your nation you know so um so it, it, it be in the process of Right, it just you still are a nation. You're still you're still a um, yeah. According to the Montevideo um, Convention, you're still a nation. You you still are a state. You, know, you, you as, as under, under under international law, and that is something that Declaration of Rights and Indigenous Peoples is super important. Don't get me wrong, um, but there are elements of in, international law that Indigenous Peoples need to be very fluent of fluent in, and not just knowing that that is there but also exercising it yeah. and what you just now described is 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 doing exactly that it is manifesting right yeah there's, that's that's this piece of paper but you cannot cook and eat the montevideo current convention you know like you have to do something about it yeah. you know you have to put it into 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 work and the the um de facto government to government relationship that you have you know with 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 estonia it is it is it is something that um in a way you're 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 circumventing the um not in a way but you you're continuing actually with this whole mindset of you can thinking outside of the box whereas usually you think right you have to go through the united nations but now you're using the united nations as a platform as a springboard you know all right you know what i'll i'll go i'll go I'll, I'll go to print forum. Yes, I'll go do my three minute statement and everything else. Um, but, but outside of the three minutes, I'm going to talk to them. I to talk to Estonia. I'm going to talk to this country, that country, and that is what something that these people should be doing a lot more than just waiting for those three minutes, which is I know it's gold, but you have to go into government to government exercise relationship, relationship building. And like you and like you said, you know, act sovereign. It is super important if you want to survive as a peoples nowadays. Um, well, to, to start doing that. And and you know how competitive and difficult it is to get on the list to get your three minutes out there. I Me, mean, I just you know I, I'm always like amazed that you know people make it to New York and and I hear all these guys' stories and I'm like, man, they you know this village must have put every penny together just to get you mm -hmm. here. And like, if you don't get to say your three minutes, I mean, how devastating is that? You know, and, and so, you know, we always went up there with the mindset as like, you know, we're not here just for the three minutes. We, if we get our three minutes in, that's the gravy on top. What we're there to do is network. That's why we bring all those Hawaiian host chocolates. In, in the <laughs> yeah. And, 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 a, and a huge delegation as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Because mm. it's, you know, it's it's us leaving our calling card, you know, letting these guys know that, you know, we're over here, you know. Don't worry about us. You don't need to do anything wild. You know, you don't need to confront the U.S. and all that. We're emerging. We just, like, make connections with you. You know, it's like going to a conference, right? You're giving your business card out. That's the mm. same way we approach the United Nations as you know, because my, my uncle is very strategic. He always thought in those lines. And, 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 you know, us being a part of IITC, we always used to see like, oh, why are you guys, you know, trying so hard with all these like documents and all that? My uncle, you, you know, he's just like us, you know, like we're so impatient because we, we so used to just going, you know. So it's it's really difficult for my uncle to, to sit in a lot of these meetings because this is mm. moving way too slow for his taste. But He's seen this aspect of the United Nations at the forum because, you know, and, and so now we utilize the forum as, like you said, our springboard to meet all these other nations. That's the only time indigenous peoples get to be in a room with all these different nations and all these different representatives. Of course, they're not the president of that nation or or even their, their top delegate to the United Nations, you know, the regular forum. But they're still a representative of that forum and 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 to to not 
utilize that opportunity to be in a room with all these different representatives from all these different nations it would, would be um, a shame to waste. So even if we don't get our three minutes, I mean, and that's why every time we go to the UN, we, we, we go in there to be a different kind of example for indigenous peoples. Yeah, we're all in there and, and we're all indigenous peoples and all that, but we don't need to just be in there for the three minutes of sorrow, right? For the three minutes of what is happening to us. Yeah, that's what we did the first year. Every year after that, we went there to share what we did during that year, you know, to give an update, like a state of the state to what we've been doing in our nation. Just yeah. to show other people that, you know, maybe if you don't get to have your three minutes and all that, you take whatever information I got to share with you, the solution that I had, and you at least get to take that back with you. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so, so, so for, for people's imagination or so that people understand, um, the way that Brandon and Nation of Hawaii participate in in the print forum is so you, you should follow them with a with a camera um, as a, like a behind the scenes kind of thing because there, there, there's a, there's two things that I would like to highlight. One is because um, I've been I pay a lot of attention to statements how how people draft them how they present them and. Um, Nation of Nation of Hawaii. It's not just Brandon, but Nation of Hawaii is one of the few, um, um, and it's a it's a very short list, very few um, representatives of, of speakers that they when they talk and when it comes they they talk with intent to inspire or motivate action um, that can motivate other indigenous peoples to do something similar. Or and to do it, the way that, that I listen to it is like this should be an invitation. This is like it is an, it's, it is an invitation. It is an invitation to other indigenous people. All right, hey, hey guys, talk to us because we have something that that can help you. That's one thing. The other thing is is that and this, this is just how I how I look at it. Like Brandon, like correct me if I'm wrong, um, but the way that I listen to you to your when I hear your statements, and you can you can you can see some of your statements on online YouTube and, and Facebook as well, is you treat it as a general assembly, as in you as a nation of Hawaii goes to the print forum because in a way it is a general assembly for indigenous peoples because a lot of not not this year obviously, um, but it's where it's an intersection for indigenous peoples like like a hub everyone comes together comes to that meeting, and. The nation of Hawaii, what they do, and this whole, where whole act sovereign comes back into play, is they treat it as a general assembly. They give like a state of the union in three minutes <laughs> kind, of, kind of speech, and I think that is that is diff this is a different way of approaching things, which is important um, as well. You know, like there, there's there is a time and place for human rights violations and everything else, but there's also it is also very important to bring in inspiration and and and, and good practices and, and good examples um, so that people, like, they don't go home with um, a video of the three minutes uh, at, at, and, and they stayed for two weeks at, in New York, paid, the whole village paid for, 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 their, for, their, for their stay at the YMCA uh, and, and the flights uh, with, with, I don't know, eight or ten layovers. And the only thing that they go home with is like, yeah, I have a video. I, I presented three minutes of my statement, and that's it. Not like you need you need to see it as an as an investment. You, you, it's and the ROI or return on investment should be, um, yeah, should be one obviously the three minutes, but also that you can come home with more than you than you brought into it. Which is which could be like new relationships, new ideas, and 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 to break through that pragmatism to to really put um, that Article Three, so the right to self determination, really into work. You know that it is that you can really exercise it, and that is I don't know the two things my, my two takeaways from from the um, the nation of Hawaii statements. Um, yeah, is it intentional or am, am I like dead wrong? And should I just shut up and uppercut myself? Um, no. on... if you hit it, you hit the nail. You hit the, you, 
you hit the head of the nail right there. You know, it's 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 what we have to work with. You know what I mean? We're not, you know, if somebody gives you bread, you're not gonna wait for cake to come in order to eat. You know what I mean? We have bread, let's make the best of this bread. Let's put some sugar on top, let's put some whipped cream on top, let's get creative. And that's mm. our cake, you know. We're just working with what we have. They gave us a permanent form on indigenous issues. That's fine. We're in the same building with the General Assembly. So what is the difference? It's no difference to us because they're telling us it's not a difference. That's why they don't want us in the General Assembly. It's the same thing theoretically to them. So yeah, okay. Yeah. I'll treat it exactly like that. You know, I'll, I'll take my time to address the oppression that is happening in our lands, to address certain things, and then to pivot to what we are doing to stop this, uh, you know, aggression and to stop that, you know, I'm always motivated and, you know, before, right. When, when Bolivia would give their you mm. know, speech, the, the, I mean, the, the 30 minute speech. Oh my God. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm whole that, you know, the first time I heard, you know, him, him um, and that's too bad that he's not there anymore, but Evo Morales, you know, that yeah. Yeah, uh, Morales, you know, I mean, he's not a, he's not an angel. He's not a perfect person, but, the way he will just say exactly the things that we understand to be true about colonization, about how these banks and how these corporations are, are you know, taking us over me. I always thought that, you know, if I, you know, when I get my chance to talk, I, I want to talk like that, you know, confident. But then also he has hope at the end of his speech. He's talking about, you know, what Bolivia is going to do to help the indigenous people, blah, 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 and all that. And, and, and you know, I would love to give that speech too, but you know, we really cannot help every single indigenous person, but we deliver our message in the same way. You know, it's a defined message, but it's also an inspirational message to to get everybody else motivated to do the same. You know, it's like a subliminal message. We're actually talking to our indigenous peoples because these other countries, they won't give a shit about what we talk about. No, yeah. you know, they're, they're just listening like, oh yeah, oh, that's cute, you know, whatever. But I'm talking directly to our brothers and sisters. And if they pick up on it, they're hearing exactly the message we're talking about right now. Yeah. It's like, you guys can do the exact same thing we're doing um, in your own way. Yeah. And you don't need to be shame about it. You don't need to be afraid to do this. We're doing it. Come search for us. Come look for us. Come connect with us. You know, we're, It's yeah. an open invitation for them to connect. Yeah, the the thing is like misery likes company, right? You know, like so so what once uh, like so you we all and yeah, it, it's it's a it's a it's a circle. We we keep on sharing um, like the, these human rights violations, and of course, it is very important to 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 talk about like the injustices that are happening right now, colonization and and everything else. I I, I get that. But it is also very important that you come out of it with, with it's what, what Victor talks about in a different context about dependency language is, is you talk about human rights violations and the end of it is like, oh, please help us, um, United Nations, uh, do, do this. Or whereas you can also flip the, flip into it like an indigenous iteration by saying like, um, this is what's happening. This is what you want you to be doing, but this is what we're gonna do. <laughs> it, it changes the thing. The whole the whole thing. You change yeah. the narrative. It changes your whole mindset um, into self empowerment. You know, and if everyone did that, you know, like it would this it could be a platform or any other meeting of, of indigenous peoples. It could become some a hub of empowerment, which yeah. is not happening right now, um, unfortunately. And and it starts with 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 statements. And you know what was mind boggling to me is why people like Barack Obama, Evo Morales, all these heads of states, you know, like they can talk like use normal language. They don't use like difficult <laughs> lingo. Like they just talk normal language. Why can't we do it? The, the, the opposite. The opposite is happening. Indigenous peoples. We were, we're communicating with a vocabulary, with a language that is not natural to us. We we try to um, we use um, articles of the Declaration and everything else, but which is important. Um, but we are trying to use language or trying to translate our our our, our 
our message into a language that is not natural to us, which makes it inauthentic. Right. Whereas the way that we talk story uh, is 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 how Abel Morales t- t- shares his story, how Obama shares it. Like everyone shares his story, and why don't we do it? You know. So like it's I'd love to see Indigenous peoples um, try to bring it back the <laughs> Indigenous storytelling. Right. Within the three minutes, obviously, um, but you know, like, all right, this is why I'm talking to you. This is how we are going to change the world. This is what we need from the from the unit perform. Hey, oh yeah, and by the way, this is what we're gonna do. Boom, right. ready? Yeah, let's right. three minutes. Mic that, drop. Yeah, <laughs> mic drop. You know, like all these mic drops of twenty five hundred. Oh, I would love it. That that that's that's what we need to work towards. You know, it yeah. is. Oh. We need to, and this is, we need to see the UN as a platform where we come together, but not as a platform that owns us. Exactly. Exactly. We need to, yeah, we need to use it as a, as, as a, as as an intersection, you know, like where we all come together. All right. Hey, this is what's going on. Because it it is how, in any way you look at, at it, it has an influence into our lives. And also you have to participate in it. You know, it is important that you that you make sure that it doesn't go too far to the left or to the right, you know, but that it does do within the realm of 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 what's what's um uh, what's justified, what what is um within et- ethics. Um but like and maybe th- this is where the whole bl- your whole blockchain mentality comes in. It is because blockchain it brings this the Autonomy gives it gives it back to the people, you know. So instead of like everything goes to one place, which is for Indian peoples the UN, it could be like, all right, let's create a connection between Nation of Hawaii with Indian peoples in Guam or mm-hmm. uh, um, I don't know, Enderoy in Kenya, you know. And then you create these these linkages, then that in itself becomes a a system, you know, that that it helps one another, and uh, uh, mutual recognition comes comes into play because we all um, try to do what's best for the whole movement for for, for the for for the f- to safeguard the the balance, not not balance, the harmony yeah. with, with 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 within all these. Because and this is what I've been thinking about. Because every every one size. When I, once I ask you about like, hey, you should come on the show and talk about Ahapua'a and Nation of Hawaii, something popped into my head is, is there, isn't an idea to do like a blockchain kind of structure for indigenous nations um, so that there's no long, longer a need for a hub of indigenous, of because that's, that's what's happening right now. You see all these, these, Councils, world councils, uh, United Indigenous Peoples, nations, whatever, and it, it, it creates this funnel, which does away with the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples because you, you you're giving your sovereignty away. Yeah. And yeah, like I don't know, like have you thought about it? Because you, as you are an imaginary, you're one of the bright minds of Nation of Hawaii, one of the many, obviously. Um, is it an idea, or sh- sh- should should I? Just shut up about about it, or like uh, no, any. It's it's oh. like 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 how you said anything is possible, right? Mm. And why not? Why can't we do something like that? You know, it's something we've always thought about. We we've always thought about like creating our own United Indigenous Nations. You know, creating a platform where people come, and you know, we thought about doing it in New York. Actually, we thought about like you know. We would all go to the UNPFII, you know, during that one week, you know, the, the one week that everybody usually stays in, and that second week that, you know. Everybody they, bolts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody digs out. We'll have our conference then where we come and we, we all get to network together. We rent out a hall or whatever. It, even we rent out the UN or, or some our rooms close to there. Mm-hmm. You know, we just copy them, you know, and, we, and, and that's the place where, you know, we bring our solutions together. Okay, yeah. we give problems to the UN. We let them, you know, have that. That's that's what they like to do. They like to parade us out there, and 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 
have us cry on their shoulders like they're going to do something and they don't do anything. We give them that. And then our conference, we start talking about the solutions, you know, and then we have our own conference so that we all leave with this feeling like, you know, fuck, we're, we're all fired up. Let's go back and let's start doing this. Let's connect with Nation of Hawaii. Let's connect with Navajo Nation. Let's connect with these guys. Let's go already, you know, because we don't have that. The, mm. the indigenous forum is not that for us, not yet, but it can be, you know. And like like you like you said before, we have to use the indigenous platform and and the forum to our advantage. We have to exploit it. We have to use it like they're trying to exploit us. You know, me, I always get this. Every time I think about the UNPFI, I think about the first day and I think about how everybody get dressed up and then they go around <laughs> they, they take all the pictures of everybody and, and it's, it's good for the UN to pat themselves on the back. Oh, yeah. look, you guys in and they get to parade and, and all that. And they use that and they take that like they did something for us and they didn't do anything for us. So our whole mindset is, no, we're not going there so you can use us. Yeah, you, can, you get your one day, you get to take a picture. The rest of the days, I'm there using you. Yeah. I'm using you every other day after that first day. That's my time now that I'm taking back from you. And, and I use you. And I use that platform. Every time we, we do a video, you know, we go viral because it's at the UN. I mm. could do the exact same speech at, at, at our nation. And yeah, maybe we get 1,000 views. But if I do it at the, the UN, I get 30, 40, yeah. 50, 60,000 views. More people we get to connect with. There's people in the room that want, that are listening. You know, all that kind of stuff. You know, we use it as a tool. I'm 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 always pumped when we go to the UN. You know, and and we take it as like a you know a time for us guys. That, you know, this is our goal time. This is what we wait all year to do this. You know, mm-hmm. and I, I you know I slowly starting to see some of that come out. But you know, it's it's difficult. Everybody, you know, it's not. And that's why I always tell our people over here in Hawaii, it's like, bruh, the, the amount of oppression other people are dealing with right now, you know, it, it's not even close to what we're dealing with over here. What We got to get our act together, you know, not to dog on Hawaiians, but we have a lot of opportunities to do a lot more than we are doing over here. You know, we, mm. we get in our own way. It's, it's semantics. It's ego it's all these different things but if people really are dedicated to exercising their sovereignty they will put all that on the side and just start to do some of these things and and that's why we go to the united nations and and we take it so serious because we're not only doing it for the people over there but we're doing it for our people at home to show them that something is happening you know Mm -hmm. and one way or another you know we're gonna break through you know, they, they believe in that. You know, a lot of our people do it. So we, we're doing that for them. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, d- definitely. Like, the, um, definitely the first day of the Supreme Forum is one big photo op because uh, yeah. they put us in the General Assembly Hall and uh, we, everyone has to dress up and, and it, it is. I like to dress yeah. up. I oh, like, yeah, I like I like to dress up as well, but it it is <laughs> obvious. It is obvious <laughs> that it is one big photo op. You know, like they could, like they move us. After that, they move us into a a smaller room, yeah, obviously, exactly. which was less space. Yeah, they gotta um, wipe down everything afterwards. Like... <laughs> yeah, like like free, like they they already wiped it out, wiped it down before <laughs> Corona. You know, like they, <laughs> every day, every time like, Indian people went in, then the day after, like uh, yeah, yeah after, okay. after we left, they had to, they had to <laughs> wipe it all down. You know, <laughs> crazy. Yeah, but um, what? Is so. Um, this is an interesting topic. What, what, what you talked about is that it is um, also for the people back home and to unite under. I don't. How how is it going in Hawaii? I don't know. If in Maluku, I know that there's so different organizations and factions, all pretending or claiming to have the same goal, which is independence, and there's only a few that really are fighting for independence. And of that few, there's only one or two that actually have a vision for independence. Like the other one, some of people will talk about, yeah, well, we had our proclamation and everything else, but they don't have a vision. Like, where do you want to go? Which is super important for, if you want to get people to, um, yeah. motivate people to, to, to support independence. How is it in Hawaii? Because in our case, they all say like, yeah, you have to, uh, you have to, um, Stop whatever they, whatever you're doing, and you have to 
listen to me because we have we have like five presidents. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, people love to call themselves president because yeah. Um, uh, you know, we used to be a republic. Um, in Hawaiian context, obviously, yet the monarchy. Um, so, so like, how, how, how are the, if, the you, if you can talk at all about that? Yeah, no, it's the same thing. It's the same issues. It's the same, you know, power struggle. And, and, you know, so there's like, you know, 10 or 12 kings and queens over here. You know, I, I have an auntie that is a queen. You know, I have, you know, all these different, I, I'm the deputy head of state. So I'm, you know, no different. You know, we have a head of state, you know, but it's all about like, um, like you said, you know, just uh, what we've tried to do now is focus more on the solution and not focus on what all these other guys are doing. Because, you know, generally what we're trying to do is not unite all the groups. What we're trying to do is unite our people who still haven't chosen you know, what, what organization they want to go to and support and all that. And it's not like we're trying to lure anybody away from their organization. And and it's interesting you bring this topic up because I, I knew that we would talk about this. And, and I had a Facebook Live talking about this earlier because I did a podcast where, you know, this guy was talking to us, me and my uncle, and he was like, you know, why can't all these groups get together? Mm. Like, guys all just organize and unite together because that would really help our people and and you know all this stuff and you know i was like you know bro the reason why we don't unite together is because we're all at different levels of education on sovereignty and different points of exercising our sovereignty what one organization is doing right now is something we've done 20 something years ago what another organization is, is doing right now we've done 15 years ago does it make sense for us to stop what we're doing now and go back and start doing these things all over again? You know, it's not to say that because we did it 20 years ago, you know, you don't, you know, you guys shouldn't be doing it. No, by all means, do it. Try another way. Maybe we did it wrong. You know, like the license plates, like our our, our IDs, our passports, um, giving the cops human rights violations. By all means, continue to do that. Well, we're not going to do that already because we, we moved on to trying something else because we know where that story ends up. Yeah. You know, we know where that. <clears throat> so I told him, I think, I believe that it's better for our people to have these various groups, to have these various organizations, because that way you can choose how you want to engage in sovereignty. Yeah. Are you? Are you? Do you want to um, run your license plates and, and have Kingdom of Hawaii license plates? Okay, join this organization. They're doing that right now. Do you want to go occupy Kuleana lands and, and start, you know, giving human rights violations? Okay, go join this nation over here. Hmm. Do you want to have, you know, do you want to, you know, take part in our blockchain um, voting system and use our cryptocurrency and, and exercise your sovereignty a different way then join our organization you know having yeah. different groups to me necessarily is not a bad thing because we're still trying to all figure it out right mm -hmm. we haven't built up a, a huge enough consensus to say that which organization is the one that everybody is going to follow we don't have enough numbers to claim that not even us mm. So it, it doesn't make sense for all of us to consolidate into this one organization that moves forward. Just And even if they was going to follow us, you know, I, I, I don't think that would be a smart idea because you would have all these guys that have been working towards sovereignty for the last 30 years. And what they're going to do, put that on the side to adopt exactly what we're doing. They probably won't. They'll probably pretend like they will, but then behind your back, they'll be undermining your whole situation because they have their own ideas of what sovereignty is. And that's not yeah. so, you know, having the diversity in the groups to me is not necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, you do have this confusion amongst our people and all that. And that's how I explain it to them at that level is like that's an advantage for you. And that's for you to make a choice as to how you want to interface with sovereignty. Right. How you engage in sovereignty. Are you at this level or are you at that level? Or are you at this level? You know, there are different levels that you can engage with. Some people want to get arrested. Some people want to do these things. That's not what we're doing right now. But this organization is doing something like that. Then then you go over there. And if you don't like it, you can always come back to us. 
You know, I don't know if it works the other way around, but that's how we see it. And that's the way I think, you know, there is more unity and diversity than just having unity. Unity is a false mm. narrative. It's a way for for colonizers to keep us all separated. You know, you always hear that, oh, you know, it doesn't matter if it's Hawaiians or, you know, Maluku or anybody is saying, oh, why can't all these guys get together? You know, they're, <laughs> they're never going to get together. Of course, yeah. we're not gonna get together. You guys aren't together. You call yourselves the United States. You're not united. In uni you're united in name only. Everybody has different views. Unity is a false nomer. It's it's a it's a way for for them to say that we're not ready to govern ourselves. That's what they use that word like. You know, it's yeah. a derogatory thing. It's something that is unattainable. That will never happen. You know, not not at the way they want us to happen. It it just creates another barrier for them to say that you're not ready. We've yeah. been. When the people are ready, these organizations will step up and show you that they're ready. You know, and we hope that we're not only inspiring other indigenous peoples, but we're also inspiring our own peoples and their organizations. You know, they don't want to follow us. That's fine. But they can follow in our footsteps and do the exact same thing we're doing. We would love that. that that's that's such a mindset that is... Um, definitely rare in in the maluku case definitely um cuz the problem the problem in our case is is that there you had you have these organizations that um yeah i'm going to i started this organization and oh yeah by the way i'm president so now we have like five presidents and then people are like um yeah well he's the president so we we all have to like stand behind that guy right. and my the way that i look at it is like I'd rather like you cannot stand behind a person. You have to stand behind an idea. Yeah, you know, like a person is is finite. You know, it, it, he like he can change his he or she or they nowadays can change their minds. It's a cult of personality. Yeah, and you have to need to have an idea or vision or utopian view of where you want to go and who can uh, get you there or at least part of it. You know. You know? That is, uh, and I 100% agree with you because the same same problem with us. Like, oh man, yeah. If if only the Maluku people were united, then they would be they would be independent. Bullshit. Yeah, 100% bullshit. You know, like, like it is. We've we've never been united. Yeah, and, like, and we'll never be united. Yeah. Um, in a way that um will satisfy them. Right. You know, like the, the, the view of what United is or should be. Exactly. It's not our way of, of what United is, um, but like standing behind one person. That is their view, their colonial view of what United is. Whereas United is one idea. You, yeah. you need that one idea and that everyone contributes to it. And because like in that way, because you cannot um, kill an idea. Yeah. You can't kill it. You can't kill a person. Yeah. Mentally, physically, like in real life, or just psychologically, yes. But you yeah. cannot kill an idea. You know, so you need to have like, like if if and I think the idea of nation of Hawaii is so strong, actually, that that and that's such an idea that it's not the idea itself, but the imagination that triggers it. Is use your imagination. Yeah, like that. That's that, that's that, that, like in my humble way of, of trying to translate all this or what, what you're what you're talking about, because um, because it, it gives you permission. That that's what it does. Yeah. It gives you permission to say like, hey, um, do it differently. Like it's like Apple. Like think differently. D don't do like Apple though. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <clears throat> um, uh, but yeah, it is uh, um, something that is. Uh, not, and I can very much relate to what what, what you what you did. As you as, as you can see, that I can very much relate to what you what you did just now described in Hawaii context, same thing in the Maluku context, and it, it is it is um, trying to trying to get unity. It, it is a is a moving goalpost. You know, yeah. it keeps on moving. They they keep on moving the goalpost. It's an unreachable bar that that yeah. that they ask us to to jump over and and. We don't need to do that. Like, like, well, well, you know, because in order for 
our unity in, in their eyes to happen, I have to kill somebody else's dream of what mm. the poverty is, or I have to suppress that, you know, just so it can fit in your box. So it's easier for you to understand. And it's not on your terms, it's on our terms. So if our people want to exercise their sovereignty this way and, and, and they want to exercise it another way, then it's up to them. It's not up to you how you, how you take it. You know, it's not, you're not ordering one dish from us and, you know, I want it cooked a certain way. You don't get to choose what way it's getting. You're going to eat what we serve you. That's mm. what we look at sovereignty. It's whatever we come out with, whatever our people get behind and are satisfied with. That's what you get to eat. So eat up and enjoy it because that's all you get. From us. <laughs> like the old days, right? Like a mom's like, you got to eat it. I'm telling me that. Yeah. Uh, aunties, you got to eat it. Like, if you like it or not, you got to eat it. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. Oh, man. I got these flashbacks. Definitely like the how, like, like growing up as a kid, you're like, well, one way or another, you're going to eat it. You know, yeah. It's, yeah. Pick your poison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, when you get, when you, when you get lickens as well, you know, like, you know, you pick your poison. You know, you're like, you want to get, uh, hit by a, a belt or uh, a stick, a so stick. like you you pick one, but you, you're gonna get your <laughs> yeah, yeah. <So> you. <laughs> you're gonna get it. <clears throat> Something that um, yeah, different change of pace. Um, that I just want to yeah. Um, that there's something that 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 I saw a while ago where you. Um, you or, or your uncle, like you were posting something about about something about the Bank of America. Um, yeah. Uh, um, something with one on one hundred fifty million U.S. Oh. dollars. Right. Um, and I know that that you, you can, yeah, you can talk at the length about that. So I, I want to give you some 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 space to talk about that and explain that as well. Yeah. So. Um, like during the time that um, our nation was being created in the '94, um, there was uh, there was Bank of America coming to Hawaii, and what they were doing is they were trying to merge with one of the banks here because they wanted to expand to Hawaii. But instead of like creating like another bank, you know, and, and more competition for these local banks, they just took over a local bank here. Well, in the United States, when a bank merges with another bank, um, you have, you know, it seemed like a utility. If a utility company merges with another utility company, you have to have these public testimony hearings because now the bank or the utility company is buying up more market share than they had before. And, and every time you buy up more market share and you control more of the market, now you bring in antitrust laws, you bring in up, you know, monopolies. So they like to be able to have the communities weigh in to say if, this merger should happen. You know, the Federal Reserve puts this on. So back in 94, an organization that started in Maui, which my uncle was affiliated with and friends with, um, there were these uh, kupu nawahine uh, and, and uh, older women that they created this organization called Napoe Kokua, which was an advocate for, uh, you know, advancing uh, sustainable Hawaiian housing, affordable Hawaiian housing. And so they, um, testified to the Federal Reserve that um, the bank that Bank of America was taking over was redlining against Hawaiians and Filipinos. So redlining means denying um, people loans based on race, religion, uh, economics, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they found information that, that this bank was redlining. So when you take over a business, you don't get to erase their past transgressions. If you take over their business, like if they have fines to pay to the government, you have to pay that fine. You know, you don't get to just take it over and, oh, okay, it's all clean for you. Here you go. No, you buying the fines, you buying the, the rules that they have to follow, you buying all, all the things, the slaps, you know, the, the punishment that, that gets handed down. So we, our, um, the, that organization was able to stop this merger from happening because of this red lining. You know, so the Federal Reserve um, put out this um, 
thing to Bank of America and told them that, okay, you know, in order for you guys to merge with um, Liberty Bank in Hawaii, you have to promise, you know, so much money to the Filipino community because you were redlining against them. And because you were redlining against Hawaiians, you have to provide $150 million in FHA 247 loans, which is government-backed loans for Hawaiians on Hawaiian homelands mm. in order for you guys to take over the bank. So that was the stipulation. And Bank of America agreed to do it. So from 1994 to 1998, they were supposed to provide 150 million in loans to Hawaiians in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands uh, program, the the Hawaiian mm-hmm. Home Debt Act. So you know that was a big thing for our people because we needed more banks to be loaning to Hawaiians here in Hawaii. They weren't doing it before, so Bank of America doing that was was a good thing. Well. From 94 to 98, they only did 13 million. I mean, not even 13 million. They did 3 million in loans to Hawaiians. And, um, you know, they were in in danger of actually defaulting on this commitment that the Federal Reserve told them. And, you know, it's always sketchy to rely on the Federal Reserve to enforce these commitments because the Federal Reserve and, and these other banks they're both banks, you know, keep in mind that the Federal Reserve is not a governmental agency. It's It's a a bank, bank. you know, big bank and the small, smaller banks are in cahoots together all the time. And they know, but what they can't stop is us putting in public testimony. And so in 98, they wanted to merge bank of America wanted to merge a nation's bank. And so we put in testimony against this merger because they didn't finish the commitment that they said they were going to do back in 98. So, no, we don't want you to merge with this other bank. It doesn't matter that this bank is not here. We're going to stop the merger. And that's what we ended up doing. So Bank of America sent executives here and I talked with our organization, Uncle Bumpy and our friends, and we got them to recommit to the $150 million. And we also got them to commit to helping Hawaiians create a hawaiian owned and controlled bank and so that's really the two, yeah this is the two things now because we have the leverage right they wanted to merge with nation's bank to become one of the largest banks in the united states this was a huge merger that we stopped again because of this unfulfilled commitment so they had to do something so it wasn't just yeah they already going to have to do the commitment but that now you late so part of the late fee is now you're gonna have to help us create this Hawaiian bank. So that's what they agreed to second time, you know? And so this thing over the years became very political because you know now you get the um, Department of Hawaiian Homelands involved. And mind you, this, this commitment was to the Federal Reserve. This commitment wasn't to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. It wasn't even to us. It was to the Federal Reserve for Hawaiians. And what happened was um, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, a state agency here, got in between us and communicating with Bank of America. So now they began to manipulate Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And so fast forward to 2007, of course, they wanted to merge again. They still mm. didn't finish the commitment. They didn't even help us create the bank, but they really needed to get this new merger done. So what they did was make a deal with this Department of Hawaiian Homelands Commissioner, the head of Department of Hawaiian Homelands. And he got the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to write them off and say that they completed the commitment. And then, you know, normally when you you turn in something for 150 million, you expect like a phone book of receipts, you know, all these different paperwork to show what they did. Attached to this letter was two page spreadsheet that showed like, you know, it was like if if I was making a, a receipt for you, if you, you ain't go buy like, you know, Lao Lao's from me. It was that kind of like sad mm. looking thing. And, and, you know, it was like really put together like in a real shady way. That was because the government went behind our back and settled, tried to settle this commitment outside of our view. And they started taking it over. And so, Bank of America took that letter and just took off, and then they started to merge with all these other banks and all that. Well, fast forward to 2012, there's a new commission head involved, 
And so we brought it to his attention and let him see all the records that we kept and told him, but they didn't fulfill this commitment. Look at all the records, you know, look at all these things. So he wrote back to Bank of America in 2012, another letter and told them that, you know what, according to all these records, you didn't fulfill the commitment. And, and basically, you know, that guy that let you out of that commitment didn't get any board approval from us. So, so as long as, you know, as far as we're concerned, this commitment still stands. And that's the official statement from Department of Hawaiian Homeland. So every time they talk about they fulfilled this commitment for us and they bring up this 2007 letter, we bring up to them that in 2012, that department nullified that letter. Mm. They said that that person had no authority to do that. You know, and, and so we've been in this fight trying to get Bank of America back here to settle this commitment. And, and we've kept the meter running on them, just like how they would if, if we didn't pay our mortgage and we didn't pay them for 20 years, they would keep the meter running on them. And then there's these late fees and all that. So now, you know, we're looking at like 600 million, $700 million that, that these guys actually owe us on top of the $150 million commitment. You know, and, and we've been so hard trying to like stay on them and all they do is ignore us and we these small potato guys and we kind of get to them because we're a bank and we're bigger than people and all of these things. We got the governor of Hawaii to finally send them a letter in 2018 asking them to come back to Hawaii to settle this commitment with our organization, Napoe Kokua. They ignored him. But we took that letter around to all the county councils in, in our islands. You know, there's four county council, Oahu, which is the Honolulu City and Council, um, Hawaii Island, Kauai Island, and, and the last and most strongest is Maui Council. We got Maui Council involved and they passed a resolution to support this letter. Still no movement, nothing. Well, we started to work with Maui Council more closely because they have a lot of Kanaka on their council. And they started, you know, they're a little bit more gung-ho. They're more woke. Um, there's, you know, there's some really good people. So we got them to actually pass a resolution last year to actually um, put funds on the side to, to pursue, to sue Bank of America for this unfulfilled commitment. Because not only did they deprive the Hawaiian people of these loans, and, and this potential bank, but they actually deprived the county of the funds that the taxes and all these other things would have, you know, that they would have collected. So now Maui Council is actually getting ready to file a lawsuit against Bank of America for this unfulfilled commitment. We are also filing a lawsuit against Bank of America, but, but for us, what we're gonna do is sue Bank of America um, under the RICO statute which is a mm. racketeering, you know, this is this is the kind that took down John Gotti and Al Capone. Yeah. This is this is mafia kind of stuff on a criminal organization. We are yeah. calling Bank of America a criminal organization because they colluded with other politicians to to <clears throat> stop these commitments without finishing them. And not only that, at the same time they were doing all of these backdoor deals, they were fraudulently foreclosing on Hawaiians here and fraudulently foreclosing on people all around the United States. And so we will be suing them under the RICO statute. We didn't file our lawsuit yet, but we will be. We're working with an attorney from Miami that's fighting Bank of America in Miami and in Florida. But he believes that Hawaii is going to be the key to break all these court cases open because... Really? Yeah, Florida is different in Florida. I mean, he got really far in Florida, only to the Supreme Court, but they vote on their judges in Florida. We don't, you know, our judges are appointed. Their judges get voted on every four years like a politician. So they're a Republican state and the, the banks control a lot of these, these politicians. So they control the judges. So all the way to the point where he's ready to present all this information that he has uh, against Bank of America for all these fraudulent foreclosures and all these things, right before he gets to be able to present this information, the judge finds a reason to throw the case out or, or finds a reason to not hear it. So he's looking at our cases in Hawaii, like this is where I can bring this evidence out, you know, because it's the same thing. It's the same practices going on in Florida is the same practices going on in Hawaii. So now we're, we're kind of joining forces and taking on Bank of America with the county and with this lawyer who is actually the lawyer for Napoe Kokua. And so right now we're working with trying to get 
the county's lawyer and our lawyer together to make a really good case for the county because what we're hoping is that we make a big enough case with the county and they lose to the county and, and this will force a settlement with Bank of America and us because what they don't want is for our lawyer to bring this information into a court because once it comes into a court and then they lose this, this suit, it sets a precedence. Now it can be used in any other court case against Bank of America, something they don't want. Yeah. So it's all about trying to leverage and hold these banks accountable. And, and it goes back to this oppression that we live under the United States, this oppression that all indigenous peoples fight you know, against these governments. They want something from us. You know, they, they, they break their commitments, they break their treaties, and they take whatever they want. Well, the buck has to stop somewhere. Yeah. And in the Bank of America, it stops with us. And, and we're going to make an example out of Bank of America. They're going to they're gonna lose this lawsuit. They're going to lose to us. You know, and, and we're going to show all these other banks over here that, you know, if you keep promising to Hawaiians and not fulfilling these commitments, there are consequences. And, and, and you kind of redline against our people. So it's a, it's a, you know, it's something different from the work we do as the nation of Hawaii, but it's very, very much in line with fighting oppression, fighting, you know, the, the broken promises, fighting the injustice. And, and Bank of America is just like the United States of America in our eyes that, you know, they will be held accountable and we will trust the law and we will go through the whole process. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, they'll have to choose whether they want to continue this fight because we don't need to win just in court. We can win in the court of public opinion. We can make a big enough stink. And right now, you know, we even talking with our Senator, you know, Senator Brian Schatz, he's just become the, um, you know, the, the, the committee chair for the Indian affairs committee. And, and so I'm talking with him, his office uh, on trying to, you know, have a hearing. You mm. know, we put the real pressure on them. They like see pressure. You know, we, we put the real pressure. You, now you can get drilled on this issue. We bring Bank of America to Capitol Hill and have them answer about this commitment. And of yeah. course, Bank of America has, you know, they have a lot of influence in Washington, D.C., so it's not going to be that easy. I'm just stating that as like, you know, and then and, and we're, we're seeing that too. You know, the, 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 Guys is afraid to take on Bank of America. They're really afraid to take on Bank of America. That's, this is one of the biggest banks in the world. But, you know, if anybody can, we can. You know, if anybody can, you know, and, and, and you know, with, with the help of Maui County Council and, and, and their lawyers and, and, and the lawyers that we have working for us, we hope to reach a settlement with Bank of America and, and, and you know, bring some much-needed relief to our people here you know what we want to do with this settlement eventually is create a sovereign wealth fund where we can provide um funding to to buy lands to build more pu'ohonoa to build houses to build uh, health care centers to build you know education um you know buildings to you know just fund a lot of things that normally you know our our trusts and our organizations are supposed to do but they're so tied in politically to all these different things that uh, a lot of us aren't privy to these funds so we're mm -hmm. we're creating another trust that that can help empower our people and one of the main projects our sovereign wealth fund is going to do is finally create that hawaiian bank the bank of america was supposed to do for us yeah. and the whole idea behind the bank is that every Hawaiian would become a shareholder. We would, every Hawaiian would get one share. You know, you cannot sell that share. You cannot, you cannot give that share away. When, when you're born into this world, you get your share. When you die, it goes back into the kitty. Mm -hmm. we, we're going to leverage the wealth of our people. But this also does another thing that these guys are always waiting for us to. It unites us. You know, no matter if you for federal recognition and I'm for independence or you are 50% Hawaiian and I'm less than 50% Hawaiian. What unites us now is we're all shareholders of this bank. This bank now all of a sudden becomes like a government. You know, if you if we have a shareholder vote, that's almost like a national vote now. Mm. You know, these layers that are that are in here that that is really key. So this Bank of America fight is a sovereign fight for us. You know, yeah. these guys accountable can unlock a whole bunch of stuff for our people. So yeah. yeah. Aren't you afraid that um, this is just my concern, oh, not a concern, but a thought. 
that a um, that that the creation of this bank, or maybe you thought about it already, the creation of this bank would could also be some kind of a um, because you're trying to you divest, you know, you're trying to move away from this oppressive system. Right. That it could be in some way um, lock. lock it in, reinforce it, or uh, have you thought about it? How to circumvent well, that? Or yeah, well, you know, well, you know, as we divest, right, we always have to know that we're, you know, we're not fully off the ship. Mm. Still, we still live our lives within the system, and and we'll be there for a little while more, but we can create something that is ready to move when we're all ready to move. You know, it doesn't need to be locked, locked in. You know, mm. It can be like this floating thing. You know, it can be like this bank that, that is, that is utilitarian for our people that just lets us operate in this oppressive system more easier. Right. So the problem that we're facing over here is local banks aren't loaning to Hawaiians. Well, creating our bank, we will loan to Hawaiians, you know, you know, we're still part of the system, and it's still locked into all of that. But it it it, it gives us uh, a way to leverage our economy because whether we like it or not, we're not all using a lower coin yet. We're still using dollars. We still have to utilize a bank account. Sure. We have to, have to utilize yeah. things. So it's a transitional thing. That's what our bank is going to be too. It's a transitional thing. It'll be a national bank. It'll be a central bank one day of its own country. But you know, for 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 now. It can be solving all these issues that we have today. Another thing it does is, it is a way for us to centralize the economic wealth of our trust. You know, right now, you get Kamehameha Schools, which is one of the biggest endowments in the United States. It has twelve billion dollars in cash and assets. All that money is in First Hawaiian Bank, in Bank of Hawaii, in Central Pacific Bank. You know, when we create this Hawaiian bank and every Hawaiian is a shareholder, guess who's going to be our first accounts? These trusts. Why? Because it's in your mission to help Hawaiians. If you cannot move your money from First Hawaiian Bank into the Hawaiian bank, then stop calling yourself a Hawaiian organization. Stop purporting that you you living up to this trust. And then we're going to sue you because you're not living up to this trust. So you take your pick. You like get mm. sued or you like transfer this money out of First Hawaiian Bank and put it in our bank where our people can finally benefit from. And and, and, and uh, um, one of the things that my uncle taught me about banks, uh, because he went to central banking training with the Federal Reserve uh, when he was you know, getting out of incarceration and all that, that was part of his classes, is that they have this thing that banks do and it's called a capital leverage formula. So every dollar that gets put into a bank under the 10 to 1 capital leverage formula, banks are allowed to loan that dollar 10 times. So say if you have a million dollars and you put that in a bank, the bank can issue $10 million in, in, in loans and, and credits out into the community. So say you have somebody like Kamehameha Schools and they have $12 billion. And now we become the managers of that $12 billion in our bank that we are shareholders of. Our bank now has the ability to lend 10 times that amount into our community. $120 billion in, in assets and leverage that can go into our community to build housing, to, to fund businesses, to do all these things that the banks over here are failing to do. You know, right now, we're just trying to use dollars and credits and, and, and all these different things to, as a means to an end. You know, what we're ultimately looking for is our sovereignty. Uh, and But what talks today? Economic leverage. Economic leverage is stronger than political leverage right now, if we're being totally honest. Mm. Economics gets people elected. Economics controls politics today. If we have our own bank and, and our bank is empowering our community and our bank is loaning money into our community and, and letting our community prosper, then we have the ability to leverage that into political strength, you know, the, the and, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that this solution is for everybody, but think about it, you know, think about these types of actions as, as a way to exercise your sovereignty. You know, a lot of people don't like to talk about money because they're afraid that 
corruption sneaks in and all that. We're going to have to watch out for those things too. When you, mm -hmm. when you become very powerful and you become very wealthy and all that, you know, things can go astray and all that. But, you know, let us guys figure that out. Because right now, they're playing with our money. They are, you know, controlling these things. And, and, and you know, if we can transition anywhere, what we need right now is resources, economic resources. Our bank will try and provide that as best it can. You know, uh, more than any other bank has ever done for our people. Mm. You know, so sometimes I get deep into this stuff, but it's just really like we all going back to the same solution. You know, we all going back and circling back to what we're really talking about, which is independence. You know, yeah, it, it's a, it's a means to an end, right? And all right. that. Like, pe people look at it from the optical side of things. Um, oh, um, because so if if for example, if you would talk about, all right, yeah, Hawaiians just want to create a bank, people would talk about it at face value, like, oh, it's not a good thing, it's not, it's not a good thing, it can all corruption, blah, blah, blah. But if if you put it into like into the right context, if you um, help it, help establish it or let it establish on certain conditions, you know, that... Um, and you have a plan with it. You have an idea behind it. Then it it ch it changes the narrative. It changes the way that people look at it. Yeah. But the problem is nowadays people don't look at it at the context. People just look at all right. Yeah, these crazy Hawaiians they want to create create their own bank, or they want to fight uh, Bank of America. So I that's that's why I I am I'm so grateful that that you, that you unpack it and. It's, it's like a deep dive, you know, like you, you, you unpack it, um, not just what, what it is, what, why you do it, uh, you know, what it is, but also why you do it, you know, that it's, it's part of a larger scheme. Yeah. Well, scheme is, is not the right word. It is part of a larger plan, you know, like part, idea, Yeah. you know, and, and, and I think that is important to, to, um, yeah, to, 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 to explain um so that people can the, the, the people that are listening and are watching next time they hear something about bank of america and versus uh the nation of hawaii or like or whatever entity that is that's fighting it they can put it into the right context yeah this this is not a just a we want 150 million or six plus 600 million is more than that you know it it is it is the under, undercurrent of it is independence is, is sovereignty and taking care of your people you know and that is and you only get to that you only get to that if you give time and space for people like yourself to explain that you know and 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 anything anything that is super important and i just i just wonder actually is it because it is such an important the way that you describe it is such an important um action activity or thing that that is happening right now um is it getting any political support uh, from from uh, for, for, uh, um, uh, or well you have oha right now uh, is, is it getting any support because it is in the benefit of the hawaiians well well it's it's you know it's it's in the periphery it's 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 being talked about because we going around talking about it and mm. we're and, uh, but you also got to understand that Bank of America, has their own lobbyists and their yeah. work are politicians. And they've been able to stop a lot of different things going forward. But what we were able to do is, you know, lock into people like Maui County, who is able to put up a retainer of $200,000 to hire a lawyer, something that we cannot do, mm. to fight Bank of America until it's done. And we just had a hearing um, the other day, because they had to create another resolution to actually put 90 more thousand into the kitty. Because what happened was the first time they passed this resolution to to hire a special counsel to seek legal, um, you know, means against Bank of America. Bank of America, three hours later, sued Maui County. <laughs> and so Maui County had to use this special counsel to actually defend them in court. And, um, you know, so that 
wasn't part of the resolution, right? The resolution was for them to to sue Bank of America. Well, Bank of America, this is this is part of their strategy, and this is part of you know the way they they mess with people is they get so much money that they can actually create one frivolous lawsuit. And it was called a frivolous lawsuit in federal court over here when it got put towards a judge that, you know, they were trying to circumvent and preempt the lawsuit that is going to come down against them and try and get the, the judge to invalidate that lawsuit even before it gets out of the box. Mm -hmm. so when it went to court, um, the judge saw that and, and, and explained that, you know, this is only, only a bank like you can actually bring this lawsuit to me because nobody has the money to have this kind of preempted lawsuit. What are you expecting me to do? Ruin your favor? I have any, you don't even know what Maui County is gonna sue you for. They've only passed a resolution to hire a special counsel. So they got scoldings, major scoldings, and their, their lawsuit got dismissed against Maui Council. But we had to pay that lawyer. So Maui County voted to add additional 90,000 so that they didn't need to touch the 200,000. So that that two hundred thousand can go fully towards fighting Bank of America, mm. and at the end of that hearing, you know, I, um, I gave testimony, but I, I listened on, and they were like, you know, we're with this all the way, we're all in, however much it takes, until we win this lawsuit, we'll keep funding this. So, if it's another three hundred thousand or another million, they're in it. You know, we've motivated them. We've we've worked with these people long enough. We've got the political backing, you know. We, you know, it's not like we can do this with every county council and, um, you know, with our attorney general and all these guys. Those mm -hmm. guys, a lot of those guys gave us the cold shoulder, of course, because Bank of America got powerful lobbyists. Mm. But lobbyists never work on Maui Council, so now we're focusing in on Maui Council and what they're doing over there. You know, just being really strategic because, you know, again, we're operating with very low funds. We're fighting one of the biggest banks in the world. Yeah. So we have to be really strategic in how we divvy up our time and how, how much we put you know pressure on these guys. So Maui Council has been the biggest political support right now for us, and that's been good enough. Um, and then you know I talked about Senator Schatz getting him to to call a hearing. That's been a lot of work trying to get him to do that. You know it's not an easy thing to do, but if we can somehow convince him to to create a hearing where we can bring up the issue and, and Bank of America can, can at least get on the agenda. That's more political pressure for Bank of America to come to the table to, to settle with us because what bank wants to go in front of Congress and, and get grilled? You know, they don't mm -hmm. want <clears throat> that. So in order to avoid that, you come to the table and you settle with us. That is our whole thinking, you know, trying to put all these because now it's a political thing. We tried the people way. We tried the co you know the community effort and all that, yeah. and that's fine. But it's not a big enough issue where everybody can get behind. There's a lot of moving pieces. It's a lot to explain, but we can try it with the political side, and yeah. we can try put these pressures on them, and and then we'll 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 actually shed light on the fact that the Fed there's a bigger issue here that the Federal Reserve is not keeping these banks in check you know so it's not just our issue here but it, you know what about other commitments that are being made to indian country to to hispanics to to the african community and and are not being fulfilled this must be happening all over the place and they're allowed to skate this because there's no enforcement on this we're trying to create a way for them to change you know uh, that so nobody else has to go through this kind of fight yeah, I was about to say that, that like if there's um if they they try to get away with it, right? Um so in a way it could be that they gotten away with it before uh okay. or that they all already um did 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 it with with tribal nations in 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 the, in the mainland. So that was I was about to ask actually. So but you already answered it that maybe it could also trigger some kind of a uh, tribal nations, First Nations, whether we recognize or not, to look at, hey, by the way, I, this is happening right now. Maybe uh, what they did last time, it was also, um, it, it also stinks. So, yeah, is also one question is because it's been a longer process. 
any you would you would assume or not, not I'm sorry you would I would assume that um there would be some help from I don't know Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard you know or is is that oh she's gone already not, okay, she's gone already yeah she's she's now doing her own what political action committee kind of thing but like before any any support f f from that from that end not 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 mm -hmm. really and and that's that's part of the issue because we got to get more guys involved and more people involved so now we're including the senator right so yeah. the, shots is probably the most powerful senator yeah. from hawaii right now you know mm -hmm. as far as you know as far as um what he can do because he chairs a committee um he's a senator of course which is higher than a representative yeah you know and so we're finally trying to leverage that. It's all timing, right? You know, we can't just get him to do something. And when he actually can't, so then he starts using it as like, a, um, you know, like making like he can do something, but he can't. Now he can do something. So we're going to hold him accountable to doing something. You know, we couldn't call on him before because he was in the chair of a committee. So he could use us as a talking point and say he supports us and all that. But that doesn't yeah. do it, right? Mm -hmm. We're learning this through the process of having these letters, you know, from our governor being sent to Bank of America, which they just blatantly ignore. We see them ignoring politicians. So that tells us that these banks feel like they're above politicians, they're above people. Mm. But when you chair a committee, now you're able to bring them before Congress under oath yeah. in front of the country and ask these questions these uncomfortable questions and sometimes they purge themselves or sometimes they just make themselves look very bad because this is not a court of law. This is, I mean, it is a court of law because if you, you commit perjury in Congress, you, there's consequences, but it's yeah. also a court of public opinion. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Don't want to get embarrassed over something as small as 600 million. That's small to them. That's not big. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> So 600 million and it's like a David Goliath, David versus Goliath kind of thing right now. It, it is this big entity as Bank of America versus uh, uh, native native Hawaiian. So it is, um, yeah. So it is such a, thank you. So, yeah. Thanks so much for, for explaining that. Cause um, uh, I, I, I had a hard time grasping the idea and, and what it meant. So, yeah, I really yeah. appreciate it. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of people do. That's why it's hard. You know, it's hard for things to go viral, stuff like that, right? Like Mauna Kea is easy to go viral, right? TMT and all that. There's there's a good guy. There's a bad guy. You know, they, you know, this guy is trying to build on this site. We see the problem. We see the action and all that. This thing has so much history between it, so much broken promises, so much corruption. You know, it's hard to, like, explain, so it's harder to go viral. Mm -hmm. Plus, bigger than Mauna Kea. This is bigger than TMT because we have something to gain at the end of this. You know, we have something to leverage now if we win this fight. You know, this is something, you know, that should be larger and talked about more and, and more people know about it. But you have to take the time to understand that. And, and in society today, you just people don't have the time. You know, it has to be viral. It has to fit within that character limit on Twitter. It has to <laughs> hashtag, you know, yeah. and, not as sexy as as Mauna Kea, but is almost as important, if not more important, because it can possibly unlock a lot of the problems that we're the barriers that we face today. Yeah, yeah, and and we're we're so we're so focused on things going viral today that everything is so geared towards towards that. Whereas yeah. the, the the more the more, more damaging things to society to peoples. Are the things that are like the the silent killers, you know, like the, the ones the things that are like under the surface and they just keep on um, eating away or like they keep on destroying you, and which is not it's hard to translate to to an image, you know, to to video, like yeah. Monokea, like well, right. The 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 issue with Monokea, the undercurrent is obviously is is colonization and and and, and oppression, um, but it is. You can see it because it is, yeah, it it is TMT versus uh, versus Mauna Kea. The thing is, with with um, 
colonization, it is very hard to put that onto a onto 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 an, a video of a TV screen. You know, like it is. Um, yeah, it's hard to to put oppression on TV. Um, whereas people are yeah use image right now a lot, and which which is very hard for 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 people to make other people aware of of oppression. And I think the only thing, way that I know is, you know, you know what? I'll just do this long form conversations, and 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 people that want to know, they 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 stick around, you know, like they 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 listen, and and they and, and and that's why I feel like you know things, social media like Clubhouse, this is what that's made for. Now. You know, mm. you, this discussion inside there, you know, it's not just this post where everybody's commenting, and you know, it's like. You know, people cracking jokes and memes and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's like, no, it's a real conversation. So, I mean, I, I'm looking forward to actually have a room where we talk about Bank of America and what happened to us. And you should. Part, where, yeah, no, you know, just, you know, I've been thinking about it for a while. And, and you know, I wanted to talk about our nation and, and, you know, everything else that we're doing. But also, now that I think of it, Bank of America would be a perfect subject, too to talk about inside these rooms and, and invite a whole bunch of people and, you know, see where that conversation goes. It has to be a conversation because people have so much different questions mm -hmm. and we have a lot of these answers. It's just, it's going to take time to explain, but in a way it, it allows everybody to learn at the same time because they all have the same types of questions. So you answer it, you know, one time for that room, you know, next week you have the same room. You know, you just keep educating people. Everybody's going to be caught up to speed. Then it, yeah. you know, it begins. The firestorm begins. Yeah, definitely. I know we're coming up to the, to the three hour mark, so I don't want to take too much of your of your of your time. Um, so just something which is in line with with Clubhouse um, is that I um, I just want to make make um, make a point. I want want, want to. Um, not a big point. I just I want to encourage you um, and the nation of Hawaii um, to yeah to do a podcast, uh, um, do something like this or whatever um, or, or audio or, or video because um, it, it it is nowadays super important that you and we talked about it before offline obviously for for a little bit, um, but it is um, you cannot rely on the three minute speeches, you know, within the United Nations, you know, to do, to really be able to, um, yeah. Explain to people like people, people, yeah. Like you want to, you talk about it on, 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 on clubhouse, for example, it's about educating people. And I think this whole you, podcasting for nation of Hawaii could be such a good avenue to, to document your your um yeah your growth you know the how, what you do and and why you do it and everything else because it becomes like a playbook becomes yeah. like a blueprint yeah and I, th I think that can be super at least i know for my nate from maluku nation definitely it can be super beneficial and i'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna show it for a lot of indigenous peoples as well um do that and i hope yeah uh, i just want to like encourage you to do to do it um because it's 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 free media you can yeah. do it for free you know like you do just pop up your laptop or and open up your camera record it and it's done you know like it is and i'm you know this all only this pro program I have, to, I have to pay for it but posting and every youtube is free and and and, and anchor is free you know so um have you ever yeah you're thinking about doing it um what was yeah. it yeah actually we are you know we were we're trying to um you know, me and John Garcia, you know, our technical guy here at the nation that, um, you know, comes to the, the permanent forum and takes our pictures for us and, you know, all mm. his, but, but, you know, one of his other jobs is to, like, he, he was the one, you know, me and him, we, we created Exchange Avenue, this app. So he's very technical and into a lot of these things. And we've been talking about it for a while because, you know, we do the lives, we do all this stuff. But, you know, having the podcast is, is like you said, it's another medium for people to digest information and and everybody's into podcasts nowadays you know and and it's it, like you said it's a way for us to like you know it's it's like a time capsule you know of the times you know and 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 your story and 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 you'll listen to it evolve and and i 
I believe like you, we should all be doing podcasts, all indigenous peoples, no matter who you are, no matter what your story is, it doesn't need to be the most cleanest and, and, and no. yeah, most professional host and, and the most prepared. It can just be you talking with a kupuna, you know, talking with your ancestor, talking with your elder and getting their story down. So we don't lose those things, right? And 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 documenting your journeys because people are interested. People want to learn about them, and 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 I I believe people want you know want to follow and learn about us. And so we have to provide them as many ways to digest that information. It can't just be Facebook. It can't just be Clubhouse. It can't just be you know everybody else's podcast. Now we have to create our own. One hundred percent. So, yeah. yeah. You doing a good thing, you know, bro. It's, it's uh, just just trying, you know, like yeah, it's inspiring for us guys too to watch you just get in there and do it. You know, that's all you did is is get in there and do it, and everybody hovered. You know, it was it was a platform for everybody to to go off on and to share their stories. You know, all these all these podcasts that you were doing before the lives and all that you were doing before. People, people got excited to to come on them and share their story because somebody was finally, you know, helping them share their story. And little do they, they know that, you know, they can share their own story and they yeah. can become their own narrator and they can they can do it however they want to do it. 100%. Like the, the only reason why I'm doing this, um, not sorry, there's two reasons. Why is documenting for myself and great-grandchildren so that they can, like, when I die and they, they know, like, learn from my mistakes, one. And two, um, I want to give people permission to do the same. You know, like, um, you know, like, it's a dirty wall, you know, like, you, it doesn't have to be like, like a, a nice backdrop or like VR or whatever on all, all that bullshit, you know, like, just, just, just record, just have a conversation and you suck at the beginning. You will suck, you know, yeah. which is fine. You know, like I suck a lot. I still suck. <laughs> I still suck, yeah. You know, and which I'm I'm fine with it. You know, because yeah. I'm like I'm I'm learning in public. You know, like I'm learning from uh, about the nation of Hawaii, the whole situation around Bank of America. You know, I could I could I could Google it, right? But I wouldn't know the context. Now I just learn firsthand information. I ask questions, stupid questions from time to time, uh, you know, uh, or like like very ignorant questions, but. The, I'm trying to understand the world, the Indian world, and um, and I'm sure that there are people that are trying to understand it as, as well. So might as well record it and then chuck it on YouTube and podcast and and, and yeah, and so that other people can learn as well. You know, so um, yeah, by all means, uh, start one. Uh, and um, if there's anything that I can help you with, let me know. Um, I'm right sure that you, you have John, your, yourself, uncle, like, geez, like I, I, I would do like every, I would do every Friday a live Q and a with uncle Bumpy and like the, the people can like, all right, ask, ask questions. And he just shoots off yeah. bits and pieces, you know, nuggets of information. I would do that. You know, like it would, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Th it's, I have so many, f or, or, all right, here's another one is well, it, I, this is something that I have in my head. But it's more appropriate that you guys do it. And it's called a, a show called Find Your Nation. It's not building your nation, but it's finding it. Because you, you mm -hmm. talk about like, right, Kapuna ancestors, you know, you, so you backtrack to it and then build from it, you know. So that's like find your nation. And you just, so just like, yeah, you know, sit with your Kapunas and, and, and like, all right, hey, here's how we would shape it, build it, whatever. You know? So QA with, with, with Uncle or with, with yourself as well, because whole different dem demographic that you you can reach, and the women in the uh, in the community <laughs> in the nation of Hawaii as well. Like, yeah, uh, I don't no, no, I don't I don't want to get on the bad side of the of the yeah. women of the nation of Hawaii. Like, it's no, no, no don't don't want to get on on that. And uh, yeah, so it is so many great ideas that are coming up in, in my head already. Um, nothing but love for a uh, nation of Hawaii yourself. Wife as well. Uh, um, 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 probably now at work, I, I, I believe. So yeah, she's working right next door in the other room. She's working from home. Oh, okay. Well, uh, give my give my aloha to her. And yeah. is any anything that, um, yeah, I forgot to ask. 
you want still wanted to say, or obviously we can we can do a whole another episode about this. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, um, I think um, you know I just, I just want to thank you Ghazali for for providing us this platform, and not just us, the Nation of Hawaii, but providing all Indigenous peoples because we all need these places where we can share our stories, right? And we we can we can be allowed to to share our story, and we can be allowed to do our own stories you know like you know we take advantage of of seeing somebody do it and growing from it and, and get that inspiration and like you said get the permission to do it ourselves you know and and if it's not for these types of programs and the stuff that you're doing you know uh, people would think that it's impossible and and you're showing that it's not so you know i just mahalo you back for all the work you're doing not just doing this but even all the stuff that you do at the UN, for Indigenous peoples, at the COP, at all these other places that people don't even know about. You know, we're watching, bro. We're all following. And we're very much appreciative that you're there because you understand those systems and you understand those mechanisms. And we have to have our people there. Like, you know, like everybody says, right? If we're not at the table, we're on the menu. So we 100%. have to at the table we have to have people safeguards we have to have kia'i there just like we had kia'i and mauna Kea, we have to have kia'i at, at geneva and new york and you one of those guys bro so i'm a hollow you for all that work that you do. oh mahalo for saying that man i really appreciate it i really appreciate um you for who you are what you're doing um your your, your mind is it's it's so mind-blowing i just want to keep on picking it um and you know, if there's anything that you want to talk about or, or you want to, um, um, yeah, blast to my community, just let me know and we'll, we'll record a, it can be shorter form, whatever. Um, it, it's, it's, um, yeah, this, this is a podium for Indigenous peoples to amplify their message. And, and this, your message is something that I, I profoundly believe in that, that there's, um, one of the messages that, 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 that it should be amplifying. Mahalo, bro. Oh, right. Mahalo, man. All right, Thank have you. a who is it? afternoon over there, yeah? Yeah, afternoon. All right, yeah. Well, you know, then you should probably leave before before your wife gives you stink about like, <laughs> yeah. um, oh man, like way too long. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All right, um, Ben, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go, and um, yeah, we'll we'll talk soon. This is the Gomaluku podcast. <laughs>